Welcome back. Hope you had a nice uh, lunch break. I'm going to wait for a few minutes before everybody arrives. Yeah. Please don't forget to ask your question in the Slack channel, not uh, preferably not on the on the Zoom chat because we'd like, Madame, that's for you. <laughs> because we'd like to compile uh, all your questions and answers uh, directly from Slack in a nice. Uh, a nice document or uh, yeah okay thank you madam okay i'm gonna add my colleagues as co-hosts Mode Sarah and is Chloe here? Not yet. Perry, not yet. Ah, oh, you like the drawing? I hate them. I hate them. But the person who bought them is not there, so I can say it. <laughs> okay, who else I need? Chloe. Perry. Oh, it's recorded, you're right. <laughs> well, there's no way she will watch it. Okay. Okay, let's wait one or two minutes more. Chloe, are you around? I can see you in the... Ah, I see you now. And you should be joining us. Yeah, you're here. Cool. Okay, and I think Perry hasn't joined us yet. Yeah, it's too early in California. Okay. Okay, welcome ba back everyone. So this is the last session of the workshop and we're gonna talk about, let me, let me share my screen. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, an extension of a uh, multi-state models to the case where it's difficult or, or impossible to assign the state to an individual. Okay, so let me check that we are recording. Yes, I think let's stop the sharing. So we're recording. Now I need to share the uh, lecture. Okay. Okay. 
I'm coming in. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yeah. So let's go. Okay, so in this class, we're going to talk about uh, what we call, what is called in the, the literature, uh, multi-event models. Okay, so these models extend multi-state models when you have uncertainty in the in the assignment of a state, like we saw this morning, uh, uh, to uh, to individuals. Um, so before we actually jump into the the, the methods and uh, and case studies. Let me uh, show you uh, a few examples to fix ideas. Uh, these examples are from uh, from papers that were published by uh, by colleagues on uh, and and who use the multi-event models. So, for example, um, breeding status in a female roe deer, for example, can be uh, ascertained uh, based on phone detection, and you might have some. Uh, some uh, issues, some problems to detect phone, and so you won't you you won't be able to um, to assign with a certainty a breeding status to a female. The sex status is uh, often ascertained based on morphological criteria in uh, in uh, some species of girls, and uh, here the difficulty is that uh, well you don't know for sure uh, sex, but you use some clues to infer. Uh, the sex of a, of a bird. Uh, disease status in the house finches um, is a certain based on uh, examination from 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 the the bird's eyes. And when you don't catch the bird, well, it's uh, from distance. It might be difficult to uh, to determine, to classify, to ascertain the disease status with certainty. Uh, in wolves, uh, that's a, that's some work that has been done recently by uh, a PhD student of our team. Um, we're interested in uh, we're interested in the hybrid status of uh, of uh, individuals, and it's based on genetics. But there are some uh, uh, technicalities involved in the in the in the analysis, and some some threshold uh, upon which you can say it's a hybrid or it's not a hybrid and there is some uncertainty in this threshold uh, definition and uh, and this causes some uh, issues in determining for sure the hybrid status of wolves again in in, in wolves the dominant status is uh, sometimes a certain uh, determined or, or we classify the dominant status of, of wolf based on uh, some patterns in the detection uh, uh, process and in it heterogeneity in the, in the detection process with dominant individuals using more often uh, the path we use to collect the, the scats we use to uh, identify those individuals and it may generate some uh, uh, some uncertainty in the definition of the dominant status. So all these examples have um, um, something in common. It's the the difficulty uh, or even the impossibility to assign with certainty a state to uh, individuals or to some individuals, okay? And so to uh, deal with this issue, we're gonna need to explicitly consider the, the process of assigning a state uh, in a model to uh, an individual. And to do that, we'll use uh, uh, HMM again, HMM for hidden Markov models, okay? In this class, I'm going to use uh, three examples uh, to fix ideas, and uh, I will go through these examples to illustrate the use of multi event models. The first example will be about testing life history trade offs while accounting for uncertainty in the breeding status. Second example would be about quantifying uh, disease dynamics while accounting for uncertainty in the disease status. And the third example, a bit different from the two other ones is going to be about um, estimating survival while accounting for heterogeneity, uh, individual heterogeneity in the detection process, in the observation process. So let's start. First example, life history trade-offs. Um, so we're going to go back to the example that Chloe introduced you with uh, um, this morning. It's about the Suti Shea waters. And uh, Okay, so we have we still have three states like this morning: breeding, 
uh, big B, non-breeding, uh, capital NB, and dead individuals. So these are the three states. Again, uh, take some time to write down your states, your observation, and then the matrix of observation and, uh, and transition um, to, to make sure that uh, uh, you have everything on paper or, or somewhere on the blackboard to, to be able to go back to that uh, later on while you uh, code your model uh, in Nimble. So we have the state. What, um, with regard to observation, observation, sorry, a bird may not be encountered. Okay, so it's a zero. Uh, it may also be encountered, but in contrast with uh, what we saw this morning with multi-state capture recapture data, we don't know its state for sure. So it may be found and uh, classified as a breeder or ascertained as a breeder. It's, it's going to be coded one. So these are the data, uh, what you collect on the field. It may be found and, data and classified as a non-breeder in case we're gonna code this data as a two, okay, for this particular individual at this particular sampling occasion. Or it may, it may be found and uh, we cannot really determine whether it was breeding or non-breeding for some reason, so, okay, so it's a three, right? So zero, one, two are basically what we had this morning and we add a three where we don't really, uh, we, uh, not really able to classify the individual either as a breeder individual or a non-breeder individual, okay? That's the novelty uh, here in the data. So what do we do with that? Usually what we do uh, is uh, either you just drop this data uh, from the, or you assign uh, arbit arbitrarily uh, the three to, I um, mean the unknown state to another state, to breeder or non-breeder by, I don't know, throwing a coin or whatever, or, well, you have to do something with this data. I mean, it's there. So that would be better if we could use this data uh, while modeling, uh, modeling uh, in the modeling process. So again, how do the states generate the observations? So we have the states on the left, uh, in the left column and the observation on the right column. So if you're dead, easy, you cannot be detected and you can be encountered, it's a zero, okay? So that's, that's an easy one. Now, if you are a breeding individual, uh, that's the latent state, the one we don't actually uh, uh, have access to unless you are detected, but uh, with some issues. Okay, you can be either non-encountered, you can be missed, okay, non-detected, or you can be found and ascertained as a breeder. Okay, we, we can classify you as a breeder individual, easy. And the new thing here is that you may be found, but you cannot, we cannot really uh, say whether you are a breeding individual or a non-breeding individual, right? If you are a non-breeding individual, same thing, you may be missed, you may be uh, detected and classified as a non-breeder, or you may be detected, but we can't, we can't uh, really say whether you, you are a breeder or a non-breeder individual, okay? So that's all the possibilities. So to wrap up uh, this, this, uh, this graph here, um, each live state can generate three observations. Okay, the live states are non-breeding and non-breeded states. Okay, and the only deterministic link is the one between the dead state and uh, not encountered. Okay, the observation not encountered. It's deterministic in the sense that the probability is done. Okay, you don't have to estimate it. Okay, now let's specify the model. Okay, let's, uh, first thing we need, and it's a big difference with the multi-state models, we need initial state probabilities because we don't, uh, we cannot assign states to individuals with certainty, okay? And that's, a, that's the main difference with multi-state models. And this is why we introduced this uh, delta vector, you remember, and uh, we had some discussion in, uh, in the chat because it, it was a placeholder, placeholder in previous simpler models to uh, kind of uh, prepare you to uh, use this delta for more complex models. And this, these are the more complex models we're talking about. This delta here, the probability of initial states, in, in this case, we need to estimate the probability of being in state breeding or in state non-breeding at uh, 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 initial states, okay? For the initial states. Um, so we're going to define pi b, the probability that a newly encountered individual at first capture is a breeder, okay? And pi n b, it's the complementary probability, one minus pi b, it's the probability that a newly encountered individual is a non-breeder individual, okay? So this is the main difference with the 
previous um, uh, previous models, capture recapture, uh, multi-state capture recapture models, and also uh, single state, the Corman Julie Sieber models, is that in the previous models, we knew these probabilities. Okay. At first capture, uh, you were either in one state or the other, for sure. I mean, you, we knew that you were in that state or the other. Here, we have to estimate the proportion of individuals in each state. Okay. And we don't know it uh, uh, before actually fitting the model. Right. And uh, same as in multi-state capture recapture model, uh, initial state probability uh, for for state dead is uh, zero. Okay, you cannot be dead uh, first uh, encounter. Okay, now the transition uh, parameters. Uh, it's the same table, the same matrix as before. Uh, the the one we used for multi-state models. Okay, it describes the dynamic of the states from. T minus one from a, a given occasion to the next occasion. So from the, the departure in rows and the destination in columns, okay? So for example, uh, if you are non-breeding individual, a non-breeder individual at T minus one, you may become a breeder, you may breed the next year with probability, the survival probability of non-breeder individuals and the transition probability from state non-breeder to breeder. Okay, so that's the same matrix as before. Now the novelty is here in the observation matrix. This is where the everything is happening in the sense that um, we need to introduce two new parameters, um, beta uh, capital B, which is the probability. So just uh, ignore the, the matrix for a minute. Huh? We're gonna define first the parameters we need and then we'll go through the, the matrix. So beta B is the probability to assign an individual uh, that is in state B to state B, okay? So it's the probability of correctly assigning breeder individuals, okay, breeding individuals. And uh, similarly, we define the beta and B, the probability to assign an individual in state non-breeder to the state non-breeder. So it's the probability of correctly assigning a non-breeding individual, right? Okay. And so we put everything in a, in a matrix before. Uh, so the PB is the detection probability for breeder individual, for breeders, and PNB for non-breeders, okay? And we put everything in, in our observation matrix. In rows, as usual, we have the states, okay? And in columns, we have the observations. And remember, it's observation is non-detected, detected as a breeder, detected as a non-breeder, and detected but status unknown. We cannot really assign a status to uh, to that individual, okay? And um, okay, so now let's go through the matrix. Um, okay, um, for example, the probability of being uh, detected and assigned to the state B, okay? That's this column here. Uh, if you uh, are in state breeder it's going to be the probability of being detected, okay, and assigned to this state breeder, right? Okay, that's that's how it it's it's written. It's it's the result of two processes: the detection and the assignment. Okay, this is where the novelty occurs. Is is that we have to model at the same time? Well, uh, well, we need to define both the detection and the assignment. Okay, so first you detect it, and then you are assigned, right? Um, let's say, for example, if you are, I don't know, a breeder, um, a breeder individual, okay, and the probability um, of being detected and your status is unknown is the probability of being detected as a breeder and the times the probability of not being assigned as a breeder individual, okay? One minus beta for the breeder individuals, beta B, right? So this, this is how we account for uncertainty in the assignment of the, the state. We introduce those, those parameters for uh, state uh, uncertainty assignment, right? Okay, uh, there is one extra step is that at first encounter, um, um, you remember that uh, we condition on the first uh, on the first uh, detection, and at first encounter we don't estimate uh, detection. Uh, we we just estimate the probability of recapture. Okay, so at first encounter the detection is one, 
for sure, okay, because uh, that's uh, that's by definition at first encounter you captured. So we we need to uh, um, to make the distinction be distinction uh, in this matrix, the observation matrix here. We need to make the distinction between the first uh, capture and the subsequent uh, recaptures. So at first capture, p is equal to one. Okay, everywhere. So you just replace P by one in this observation matrix and you get your observation matrix at first encounter. Okay, so this is going to be um, um, well um, handy when we uh, uh, code the model in, uh, in Nimble. Okay, I'll, I'll remind you that uh, later on. Okay, and breeding assessment is uh, unaffected. I mean, at first encounter, you still need to say whether you're assigned to a breeder state or a non breeder state. Okay, what about uh, coding that in Nimble? So the, the model gets a bit uh, more complex. We have survival for both states, the, the, the transition probabilities between a breeder and non-breeder and non-breeder and breeder, okay? And the detection probability for both states. And we have our uh, probability of assignment, correctly assigning breeder individuals, correctly assigning non-breeder individuals. And pi is the proportion of individuals newly uh, uh, newly detected in a state. By default, it's breeder individual. I think, yeah, it's B. So it should be uh, well. You can you can stick to uh, pi, but uh, maybe it's better to uh, to say that it's uh, pi b to make sure. And the proportion of non-breeder individual is one minus pi, of course. Okay. So again, it's a good uh, practice to um, uh, take some time to uh, comment the code and uh, define the parameters first, and then the states and the observations. Okay so that you can easily uh, come back to that uh, later on when you make your comp uh, your model more complex, for example, or, um, or yeah, for example. Okay, the code, let's start with the priors. Easy, uh, easy. In our case, we have only two states, so, so we don't have to care about uh, the Dirichlet or, or the multinomial logic link or whatever. It's just two states, well, three with the dead states, but uh, we don't really care about the dead state. It's an easy one. So we have uniform distributions between uh, zero and one for the survival, for the transition probabilities, for the detection probabilities, for the proportion of uh, uh, newly marked individuals that are breeder, and for the probability of assignment, okay? So these are all probabilities. These parameters are all uh, probabilities, so we can assign the uniform distributions between zero and one, okay? Now, this... Uh, now famous delta uh, vector of parameters. So again, it was a placeholder in previous lectures to um, kind of um, uh, to, to make it easier for you when you get to these complex models to understand what the delta is. But now uh, after discussing that on, on the chat, uh, maybe for the previous lectures, we'll, uh, we'll just drop this placeholder and uh, introduce delta only here, we'll see. For, for future uh, uh, workshops, we'll see. Um, okay, so uh, the probability of initial state being a breeder is pi b, okay? For non-breeder, it's one minus pi b, and for the probability of being initial state dead is uh, zero, okay? You cannot be, uh, your, your initial state can be dead. I mean, you have to be uh, alive at some stage to be, uh, to be in the data set, okay? Um, then the gamma matrix, the gamma table, it's the matrix of uh, transition probabilities. It's the same, uh, exactly the same code as before, uh, the one that uh, Chloe showed you before. Um, so the first index in, the, in this matrix is for the uh, departure, the from. You start at T minus one in some states, so breeder, non-breeder, and dead. And then the second index here in the matrix, it's the destination, the colon of the matrix. It's the state where you are at T plus, T plus one, okay? So you can check that uh, this matrix makes sense. And now the observation matrix omega, that's the new one. Um, so again, the first index is, uh, so for the observation matrix, remember that's what uh, Sarah explained yesterday it all occurs at the same time, okay? Observation state, so it's the observation uh, you make uh, on your individual given the state it is in at this current okay, sampling occasion, right? So uh, the first index is for state and the second index is for observation. So in omega here, uh, the 
first the the first four uh, lines are four state uh, breeder okay and then you have the four observations um, non detected detected as a breeder detected as a non breeder individual and detected but status as unknown okay and th this is repeated here as a comment uh, it takes some time to write uh, down those comments but it's very very useful when you come back again huh? When you come back to the code, uh, sometimes you get lost when you add uh, time dependent or individual de uh, individual specific uh, parameters or covariates. Or and it's always good to have those comments to uh, to make sure that you don't do um, you don't do uh, uh, mistakes. Then second rows is for uh, alive in state uh, non breeder, and third row of the omega matrix of the observation matrix is for um, being dead and then again the second index in the matrix uh, gives you the observation so non-detected detected as a breeder non-breeder and uh, status as an unknown okay detected but you, you cannot uh, determine this the, the status you cannot classify the individual as a breeder or non non-breeder individual right and it's the product of the detection probabilities time those new parameters that were introduced to say whether we correctly uh, assign an individual to its state or not. Okay, like I said, we need to distinguish um, uh, what happens at first encounter uh, for this omega matrix. And I said, well, basically at first encounter, you detect it for sure, okay? The probability of detection is one. Uh, we don't estimate the probability of detection. We assume, well, we, the detection, probability of detection at first encounter is one and by definition. So we just have in, we just have to take this matrix omega and say that p is equal to one and we get the uh, omega matrix at first encounter okay so i shouldn't call it uh, init but maybe a first encounter to make it uh, clear init might be uh, a bit confusing i'll change that i think okay now the likelihood well the likelihood is basically the same as before we have a loop over individuals okay and then we have uh, for each individual we say okay that's the uh, the initial state probabilities okay so now the d cat of delta is very important because it tells you um at uh, the the probability of uh, initial state and delta is pi one minus pi and zero for uh, you cannot be uh, dead as an initial state and then the new thing is that uh, at first encounter uh, so here at first encounter we need to tell uh, uh, to write down explicitly in the code what happens for this particular observation okay for the observation at first encounter we have to say that uh, it's only a matter of assigning individuals the detection is one okay that's a, a new one and we need to have that and uh, again in uh, in nimble we need to uh, specify all the the indices so here this matrix omega uh, has uh, four columns, so it's one up to four. Okay, same thing for delta here. Uh, that's the, the difference with the uh, JAGs we mentioned yesterday. In JAGs, I think you can just say, uh, um, just drop those uh, indices. In, in Nimble, you have to, uh, it cannot guess the dimensions. And it's a good thing actually, because it forces you to uh, uh, repeat the dimensions of your object, the object you are manipulating in the, in the code, okay? And then once you've uh, dealt with uh, what happens at first encounter, initial state and the observation here, the fact that detection is one, then uh, what happens is that uh, you, um, you describe what happens for subse subsequent uh, sampling occasions. So at first uh, detection plus one uh, up until the last, uh, the last sampling occasion, okay? And so, so you have the dynamic of the states here, the Z uh, given the, the state at T minus one, and you have what happens to the, uh, the observation given the state at the same uh, occasion, sampling occasion here. And you use the gamma matrix and the omega matrix, the transition matrix and the observation matrix, okay? Right? So if you, if you use that, if you do that in a nimble, you get this result, these results. So let's have a look to uh, the results. Again, in columns, we have the numerical summaries, posterior mean, posterior standard deviation. Then we have the, 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 
a lower bound and the upper bound of the credible interval at well, 95% credible interval here and here. The posterior median here, the 50% uh, 50 here is the posterior median. We have the R hat and the effective sample size. Um, okay, the effective sample size is a bit uh, low for some parameters. We might need to run that a bit longer. And that's okay huh? for the illustration purpose. It will it will uh, it will do the job. Let's have a look to the parameter estimate. Uh, the mean posterior uh, the posterior mean for the probability of correctly assigning breeder individuals is quite low. Okay, so it's quite difficult to assign. Oops, there is typo here. To assign breeders to uh, their state to their correct state. Uh, whereas for non-breeder individuals, the, the probability is quite high. Right? So they are. Uh, relatively well classified as non-breeders, which is okay, which is cool. So it's more difficult to assign non-breeder uh, individuals than breeder individuals in than non-breeder individuals in that particular case study. And detection probabilities are uh, those ones, uh, sixty percent uh, roughly for both uh, breeder and non-breeders. And survival is around uh, eighty percent. I can't remember what uh, we had this morning with Chloe. I think there was a Yes, uh, breeding, well, survival of breeders was much lower than uh, uh, survival of non breeder when we had a look to the posterior distribution. Here it's a bit less clear. Yep. Yeah, it's less clear here, which is nice. We're using, well, we're using more data, and apparently the, the message is a bit less uh, uh, clear cutting than, uh, than before. Okay. And the Proportion of newly marked individuals uh, is uh, as, uh, newly marked individuals as breed, uh, are breeders is seventy uh, percent. Okay, and then the transition probability from breeder to non-breeder is twenty percent, and from non-breeder to breeder is twenty-five percent. Okay, convergence is okay, and uh, we're we're good to go. Okay, a visual representation. Like Chloe said this morning, it's a bit weird to represent uh, all those parameters on the same graph. Okay, you have detection parameters, survival parameters, transition parameters, and and, and those uh, probabilities of correctly assigning breeder and non-breeder individuals. It's a bit weird to have them on the same graph. But okay, for it's it's a one line of code in uh, it's one line of code in in R. So let's uh, let's use it uh, to to have a. A look at um, at once of the of the parameter estimates. Okay, before we proceed with uh, uh, the next examples, let let's uh, let's do a live demonstration. Okay. Um, okay, so I need to stop the sharing. Share again the whole screen and uh, I'm gonna go to the website. Where is the website? So the website. So that's the GitHub uh, repo, Zitori, and the website is here. Okay, and the live demos. So again, huh, we're almost at the end. Huh? So we have the tutorial with all the comments and everything and the R script. Okay, let's use the R script. R Studio should open. Perfect. Okay. I guess it's big enough. Huh? I haven't changed anything. Okay, can you see my R Studio? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. Is it big enough? Yeah. Okay. Let's do, load the package we need. Okay, I need to read. Uh, oh yeah, I need the data sets. Okay, so where is the data set? So uh, some of you have asked, where uh, can I find the data set? So if you go to the pull down menu live demos here, you can download all the data sets uh, at once, okay? You can also download all the worksheets in PDF. Same thing for the slides. Huh? You have something in the slides uh, pull down menu, you can download all the slides in PDF at once, okay? Um, so maybe it's convenient for you. 
download all the data sets, that's a zip file. Okay, so now I go into, and I need, uh, that's this one I need. Huh? Okay. Is it working better? Yeah, now it's reading the file, okay. So let's uh, let's have a look at the file and you see, well, let's have a look at the file. You see that we have, uh, we have, uh, we have what? We have a thousand individuals over seven sampling occasions. And some of them are detected as a breeder individuals. Some of them are detected as non-breeders. Some of them are uh, non-detected and some of them are detected, but we cannot really ascertain whether they were breeder or non-breeders, okay? So we have uncertainty here and we code it explicitly, right? So now the code in Nimble. Again, uh, we uh, take care of the, I mean, we, we write a lot of comments, okay? For yourself in six months and for others. But, uh, but most importantly for yourself in six months. Huh? Um, Multi-events, yes. So we have the survival, the transition probabilities, the detection probabilities, this probability of being in initial state breeder, the probability of uh, uh, correctly assigning, uh, uh, yeah, um, non-breeder individuals and breeder individuals, and then the states. So same thing as in the multi-state models. Huh? It's just that the observation is a bit different from uh, uh, from the multi-state uh, case study. Is now we have detected, uh, non-detected, sorry, detected as a breeder, as a non-breeder, or detected, but we don't know if it's a breeder or non-breeder individual. The priors, uniform distributions, it's a model with constant parameters. So it's easy, and uh, if you want to have a uh, time dependence on that, I mean, I refer to uh, Sarah's uh, lecture uh, from this morning, where she explained how to have time dependence, individual specific covariates or random effects or everything. It's exactly, it's working exactly the same as uh, with the uh, comac jolie models. Now we have multi-state and multi-event models with uh, some, uh, some extra parameters, but uh, the same idea uh, apply, uh, two uh, ideas apply to uh, incorporate covariates, random effects, and uh, and so on. Okay, so the delta uh, vector now it's no longer a one and zero or uh, or, or something. It's um, now it's a parameter that we need to estimate by b the probability of being in initial state uh, b. Okay, newly encountered individuals are breeder individuals. And then the gamma matrix, the probability of transitions uh, is the same as before, as in the multi-state model. The difference is here in the observation matrix. Now we have those uh, beta parameters, the probability of um, correctly assigning a breeder individual or a non-breeder individual. So for example, um, this omega here is the probability of detecting an individual, but not being able to say whether it's a breeder individual or not, uh, or a non-breeder individual, given that this individual was uh, alive and uh, so two is for non-breeder, okay? So this probability is the probability of being detected as a non-breeder times the probability of not being uh, 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 classified as a non-breeder individual, right? Let's take another example. This one, omega one, two, is the probability of being detected as a breeder individual. Yeah, sorry, one is for non-detected. Yeah, so two is for being detected as a breeder individual, given that one is, uh, it was alive and in state uh, breeder. Okay, so this probability is the probability of being detected as a breeder and correctly assigned as a breeder individual because you're detected as a breeder given that you are alive in state breeder. Okay, and so on. And the only thing we, know, we have to take care of, and it's new because we don't know the state for sure at uh, first encounter, is uh, we need to, um, to define this matrix 
for what happens at first encounter in terms of observation. So at first encounter, we know that uh, detection is one, it's first encounter, you're detected for sure, but the assignment uh, of uh, an individual to a state still needs to apply. So we basically, that's this matrix, this omega matrix, in which you fix, uh, you set uh, the piece to be equal to one. Okay, detection is one, but assignment still occurs. Okay, and then your likelihood. Again, you have uh, what happens, uh, the initial state probabilities, the what happens at first encounter for the first observation here for all individual all individuals i okay so it's a dcat distribution again where you take the omega matrix in which you have a, a setup p to be equal to one and then you have the dynamics of the states and the what happens for observation given the states okay so let's run that so that's multi-event. You can uh, display uh, multi-event. Uh, it's, uh, it's now object. You see, okay, you have your model. Now the um, uh, date of first capture, the before, the constants, the data, the initial values. It's a bit trickier than for multi-state models because uh, because at first encounter, you don't know what, uh, what's going on, okay? So you have, so the way we do it here is that we sample uh, randomly a state, an initial state for, uh, for individuals, okay? So we use the sample function and we say sample between a live uh, breeding and a live non-breeding to assign um, an initial value to the state, uh, to the states uh, of the individuals, even if you have uncertainty, okay? Mm. Because uncertainty doesn't apply to the states, okay? States are alive breeder, alive non-breeder or dead, okay? The, the uncertainty only occurs in the observation process, right? So and the, the underlying state is breeding or non-breeding. So we can sample uh, randomly in, uh, in uh, the vector one, two, and say, okay, every time we have a three, in the observation matrix, we replace it by a one or a two to say it's a state alive or dead, okay? And then for all the other uh, observations that are one and two, uh, uh, yeah, two and three for detected breeding and detected non-breeding, um, we can uh, say it's, uh, it's a state that uh, we actually observe, okay? Okay, take some time to... Uh, go through the way we generate initial values. It's a bit tricky for multi-event models, but it can be done. And now, uh, well, we put everything in a function to uh, generate initial values. And you see, we can generate initial values for the states and for the parameters, right? The parameters to be monitored, MCMC details, and run the um, run the model, feed the model, okay. Um, okay, so what can I add to that? Okay, the, the, the generation of initial values, the, the construction of initial values, it, it, it is a bit tricky, yeah? So, but in my experience, I don't know what uh, other folks uh, think, but uh, in my experience, uh, taking some time to think about it, it's very useful because uh, you, uh, it forces you to understand uh, even better how you, the model works, and in particular the, the latent states, the, the omega, the sorry, the gamma matrix, the, the matrix of uh, transition probabilities. Okay, so it's um, it's nice to be able to really make the difference between states and observations to be able to generate the initial values. Okay. And I'm running out of things to say while waiting for the model to uh, give results, but that's okay. Okay, maybe I can go back to yeah the lecture. Okay, I will go back to the lecture and I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you the results uh, later on. Okay, um, stop the sharing.
and uh, go back to share on your portion of the screen. Clack. I need the slides on. Yeah. And we're back. Okay, second example is about quantifying uh, disease dynamics uh, while accounting for uncertainty in the disease status, okay? So it's a very similar example to the to the, the example we just uh, had a look to. Let's have a look. So the case study is about uh, uh, an emerging pathogen uh, and its host, the house finch. Hang on, that's a picture of an infected bird. It's a house finch with a heavy infection, uh, a picture by Jim Mondock. Okay, that's uh, that's an ugly ugly infection. Okay, let's uh, let's go to something less ugly. Um, okay, so we consider this system. Um, many uh, many uh, several colleagues have already studied this uh, the impact of uh, this pathogen on host demographic rates. And the problem is that uh, the true disease state for some encountered individuals in is ambiguous because they are seen at distance. So it's difficult to say whether they were, um, well, in that case, it's easy, but for some of the birds, uh, it's difficult to diagnose uh, uh, the, the disease and say, well, they were healthy or they were infected, okay? And so in this context, how to study the dynamics of the disease? So again, we take a pen and a, a piece of paper and we write down the states. So you are either healthy, ill or dead, right? So these are the states, the latent states. And you have several observations, four of them. You are either not seen, captured healthy. So we can say that you are healthy because you are captured physically. So we can really uh, observe your eye and say, okay, you are healthy or ill, captured and ill. Or your health status is unknown because you are seen at distance and we cannot really uh, uh, assign you a, a state uh, healthy or, or sick, right? Same as before, uh, how the states uh, generate the observations. If you are dead, well, you cannot be seen, that's for sure. If you are sick, you may be not seen, non-detected, captured as uh, sick, or your status may be unknown because you are seen from distance and we cannot really diagnose, uh, diagnose the, the disease. And if you are healthy, that's the same thing, you may be uh, go um, uh, undetected, you may be undetected, you may be uh, captured and diagnosed healthy, or you may be captured, uh, you may be, sorry, seen from distance, and you cannot, we cannot really say whether you were sick or not, right? All of them together. And now, the vector of initial state probabilities, it's the same as before, for the breeding on breeding here, um, the, the probability that a newly encountered individual is healthy is pi h, and pi i, one minus pi h, is the probability that a newly encountered individual is sick, is ill, okay? And uh, the probability that a newly encountered individual is dead is zero because it's newly encountered. Okay, so the transition matrix, so the probability of um, going from some state at t minus one, two, uh, the, the states at uh, sampling occasion t is as follows. So we have uh, the probability of departure in rows and uh, the departure state, sorry, in rows and the uh, destination states in columns. Departure being t minus one and destination between uh, being t. Okay, so for example, if you are sick at t minus one, the probability that uh, you recover from the disease is uh, the probability of surviving over this interval uh, as, a, as a sick individual and to do the transition from ill to healthy. Okay, and so it's not the probability of recovering, it's the probability of being uh, uh, healthy at the end of the time interval, given that you were uh, sick at the beginning of the time interval, and it's the probability of surviving and recovering from the disease, okay? Sorry for the, the confusion. And if you are uh, healthy at the beginning of the interval, okay, uh, at T minus one, the probability that you uh, are infected at the end of the time interval is the probability that you survive over the time interval as a healthy individual and that you get infected. 
psi h i, the probability of transiting, of making the transition from healthy to infected. Okay. Okay. Now it might be that we model another disease and uh, a disease that cannot be cured. It, so how would we uh, would we do that? From the transition matrix, it's easy. It's just uh, it's just a matter of saying that you cannot come back from the state uh, sick. So the psi probability, the transition probability from infected to healthy, is zero. Okay, once you get sick, you remain sick and you cannot uh, recover. So the probability of uh, uh, being sick at uh, t minus one and be, uh, being still sick at uh, sampling occasion t is one, uh, is sorry, is one, and it's one minus the probability of recovery. Okay. And it's just a matter of in the previous matrix here of replacing uh, psi y i i by one and psi uh, h i by uh, i h, sorry, the probability of recovering by zero, okay? So you have a look uh, here, psi i h is zero if the, the disease cannot be cured. So it's a zero here and uh, one minus uh, psi i h is uh, one. So here it's a uh, five one. So this is really this row that is affected by the this characteristic of the, the disease, okay? That cannot be cured. Okay, the observation matrix now, it's, it's, the same observation matrix as we had for the Suti Shewater case study, in the sense that we introduced two new parameters, the probability to correctly assign healthy individuals and the probability to correctly assign sick individuals to their state. And uh, okay, in rows, we have the state. In columns, we have the observation. So it's non-detected, detected healthy, detected sick, and uh, detected from distance and uh, the disease status is unknown. And so again, we are detected and assigned to a state or detected, but we cannot assign you a state, okay? If you run a, a Nimble, you get the following results roughly. Yeah? You get that healthy individuals are correctly assigned. So the beta, beta H is uh, almost one. So all healthy individuals are correctly assigned, okay? Uh, while infected individuals, are very difficult to uh, to classify. Okay, it's very difficult to say that uh, an infected individual is um, is infected. Okay, uh, it sounds like being infected has an effect on detection and survival, in the sense that uh, so what the the probability of uh, being detected, uh, given that you are infected, is higher than. Uh, the probability of being detected given that you are alive and uh, healthy. Okay, I would have to uh, double check the paper to get an explanation about that. And the survival also is higher for infected individuals. Again, I don't have an explanation for that, but uh, let me check in the paper. And the probability of recovering uh, is 50%, the probability of uh, moving from state infected to state healthy. And the probability of getting infected is 20%. Okay, so the probability of uh, going from state healthy at T minus one to state infected at uh, sampling occasion T is 20%, right? Okay, so the live demonstration, uh, I think I will skip that one unless, uh, let me check. Let me check a few things. First, we're gonna check whether the previous example has converged. It should have, yeah, okay. So the Suchi Shiwata uh, live demo, back to the Suchi Shiwata live demo. And the model has reached convergence. Let's have a look. Let me find the, yeah, it's here. Let me give it some space. Okay, so these are the results, huh? basically the same results you have in the in the lecture. We can have a look to the to the estimates. Okay. Okay, so you see the effective sample size is a bit low for beta and B for the detect the, the proportion of Boolean counted years breeders. 
And for the transition from non-breeder to breeder, we might need to uh, run that for uh, longer. We might want to have a look maybe to the trace. Let's have a look. Let's have a look to that trace. Yeah. Uh, and it's MCMC multi-event. Okay. So you see indeed uh, the mixing is not that good for beta and B. Whereas it's okay for beta B and for the detection probability of breeder individuals. So it's not a big deal. Huh? It's just uh, it just need to be run for longer. That's okay. Yeah, and again, transition probability from NB to B is uh, it's it's mixing. Okay, the mixing is not totally satisfying, but running it for longer will uh, will do the job probably. It's not like you have a problem. I think. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me check what time are we supposed to uh, finish this lecture? Yeah, half past three. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna skip that one uh, to be able. Well, the 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 live demo on the disease example. It's it's basically exactly the same one as the Suti Shirota example, except that you you replace uh, healthy, you replace sorry breeder by healthy and non breeder by uh, sick. Okay, and we estimate exactly the same parameters, except that ecologically they have a different meaning. But that's the same model. If you have a look to the model for for the house finch uh, example, it's the same model as the Suti Shirota example. Okay. And you have the, the tutorial for that one. You can check the results. It's exactly the same example. I'd like to spend more time uh, talking about individual heterogeneity and also uh, a few uh, other things uh, at the end of this lecture. So, okay, let's share again the lecture. Click, click, click. Okay. Next example. So the last example is about individual heterogeneity and how to account for it in um, with uh, HMMs, with uh, hidden Markov models and um, and uh, capture capture data. Okay. So as an example, we work with gray wolves. Um, it's a social species with a hierarchy in facts. Okay, which may reflect in a species demography. Okay, and. Um, and dominant individuals tend to use a, a path more often than others. And these paths are where we look for scats. Okay, we do genetics to identify them uh, individually. And um, and uh, and by doing so, we, there is some uh, heterogeneity that is created in the detection process, in the observation process, okay? So how to account for that? Um, sorry, so the... Um, yeah, Charlie Plager has uh, uh, several papers. She's known for, for her work uh, uh, in particular, uh, among others, she, she, she's worked on many things, but uh, she's known for her work on developing uh, heterogeneity models, heterogeneity capture recapture models, in which individuals are assigned in two or more classes with class-specific survival or and or detection probabilities. So we don't know a priori in which class an individual is or is not, but using uh, the data, we can assign an individual to a, a specific class, okay? And so it will help us to uh, kind of uh, account for this heterogeneity in the detection or in the survival or in dispersal or whatever. We will have a look to detection today, but uh, that's totally applicable to other demographic parameters or nuisance parameter, that's okay. And uh, following uh, the path of, uh, Charlie, of Charlie's, uh, Sarah um, did a, a nice, very nice work on uh, applying uh, HMMs um, to account for heterogeneity in the detection process due to social status, social status in, in gray wolves. Okay, and there is also this paper by Roger Pradel uh, in 2009, uh, who is really the guy who developed uh, multi-event models. I will give some references at the end of the, of the of the lecture okay if you click on the references here and here you will be uh, taken to the to the to the paper 
Okay, so again, a piece of paper and a pen, you write down the states and the observations. So the states. So you may be alive in one a class, let's say class one, and we're going to say it's A1, okay? It's arbitrary. Okay, We just say there is two classes of uh, alive individuals, and uh, and we're going to try and use the data to uh, decipher uh, which is uh, uh, in which class each individual is um, is uh, belonging to okay belongs to uh, so three states alive in class 1 alive in class 2 okay so it's different from the common the standard common reducible model we have two classes now not just alive but alive in class 1 and alive in class 2 and we have the third state as usual the dead state okay death this dead state okay and not four observations oh that's a typo it's only two observations okay either you are captured or not that's the only information we have okay um that's really going back to the comex receiver model where we try to account for heterogeneity in the detection process okay using hidden markov models okay and some uncertainty in the assignment of, a, of an individual to a state, the state being alive in one class or the other, right? So it's two observations here, non-detected or detected. So now, what's the difference with uh, with the COMEX receiver model, with the model that Sarah uh, spent uh, some time to explain you uh, yesterday and uh, this morning? So this is really in in the, the vector of initial state probabilities and in the observation metrics that we saw for the, the two previous examples. So the vector of initial state probabilities is as follows. We need to define this pi uh, probability, which is the probability of being alive in class one, okay? Or one minus p, the probability of being uh, in class two at, at first uh, initial state probability is uh, alive in class one or alive in class two, okay? So that's the vector of initial state probability. Again, that you remember um, in the in the Cormac Julie Sieber uh, Nimble implementation, we had this delta parameter, this delta vector. It was again a placeholder for you to uh, maybe uh, 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 be more comfortable when it comes to more complex models like this one, when we need the delta vector to say, okay, um, you can be either alive in class one uh, for initial state probabilities or in class two, okay? It's not for sure in state alive. Here we have two alive states and we don't know exactly in which class we can assign the individual, okay? Now the transition matrix. So we have the states uh, uh, of departure at T minus one in rows and the state of arrival in columns at time T, okay? And we have the three states. So you may be alive at, uh, given that you're alive at T minus one in class one, you are alive at time T, uh, the next uh, sampling occasion, in the same class with probability phi, okay? And if you are alive at T minus one in class two, sorry, in class two, uh, you are alive uh, in, in the same uh, state, class uh, alive, class two, at time t with probability phi. Okay. In this model, we assume there is no, um, you cannot move from one class to the other. It's totally possible, huh? but we say, okay, if you are alive at t minus one uh, in class one, you, are, you cannot be alive in class two at time t. Okay. It could be, it could be done. We will see that in a minute, but that's not what we're going to do here. And uh, the other thing is that we don't assume any difference between uh, classes in survival, okay? The heterogeneity will, uh, will affect only the detection process, but we could do that. We could have heterogeneity in the survival here, okay? We could say phi here for um, individuals that were in state A1, live class one in at T minus one uh, and alive at uh, a at t in class in class a one alive in class one is phi uh, I don't know uh, one for example and distinguish this survival from uh, the one for uh, individuals that are alive in class two okay and say this one is phi two okay we could do that totally okay that's the kind of the flexibility of this model 
you can apply heterogeneity wherever you want, wherever you have some uh, ecological uh, intuition that it could, uh, it could occur. Okay, for, okay um, same uh, transition matrix, but now we allow for transition between the two uh, classes, uh, two alive classes. Okay, we can say, okay, if you are alive at T minus one in class one, you may be uh, alive in class two, it's possible at time T, it's just that you're going to survive and do the transition between class one and class two. Okay, so in wolves, for example, that's something we investigated. It wasn't really uh, interesting in our case, but uh, I mean, the results were not very convincing, but it could be uh, if we imagine that uh, heterogeneous classes are linked, are, are connected to, are linked, or could be interpreted as a uh, dominant uh, status, okay? Dominant individuals be being, uh, for example, uh, more capturable, then the transition between the two states might be, uh, might reflect a change in the social status, okay? Going from a, a non-dominant individual to uh, the dominant uh, class uh, individual, okay? So that could be, that could have this transition between uh, uh, classes could have a, a very interesting uh, ecological meaning, right? Okay, now the observation matrix, and this is where we're gonna uh, incorporate heterogeneity. Okay, again, we have the states in rows. Remember the observation matrix? In rows, we have the states. In columns, we have the observation. So the states are alive in class one, alive in class two, and dead. So we have three rows, and then non-detected and detected. That's, what, that's all we have in the observation, just detection and non-detection. And then we say, okay, uh, if you are non-detected, well, uh, sorry, if you are alive, the probability of being non-detected is one minus P1. So we distinguish the probability of detection given that you're alive in class one from the probability of detection given that you're alive in class two, okay? And we say there is P1 and P2, okay? This is where we apply, well, we say there is some heterogeneity in the detection process, right? If you run that in Nimble, you'll get the following results. P1 is 40% uh, and P2 is 50%. So apparently, and we could test it formally by uh, uh, comparing to a model where we don't have heterogeneity. So we would say, okay, P1 is equal to P2 is equal to P, okay? So we still have our three states, but the detection probability is the same for both states. And we could compare using uh, the WALC, for example, and to test formally whether there is some heterogeneity in the detection process. Here, having inspecting the numerical the, the results, the posterior mean, for example, well, if you have a look to the to the to the credible intervals, it's not clear, but it seems like the, the detection in class one is lower than the detection in class two. Okay. So we seem to have lowly detectable individuals, class one with a detection P1 in proportion 62. So the proportion is given by pi, okay? And then you have highly also because 50 compared to 40 is not that uh, higher than, uh, I mean, it's not that high. Uh, so let's say highly detectable individuals, class A2 in proportion one minus uh, uh, 0.62, so 38%, okay? So an important note is that this interpretation of the uh, classes is made a posteriori, okay? Given the results I get, I say, oh, we have a lowly detectable versus highly detectable individuals. So it might be that uh, uh, class one correspond to non-dominant individuals and class two correspond to dominant individuals from what we know from the field and the, the protocol, the sampling, uh, the sampling protocol and, and everything, okay? The model won't tell you um, what the classes correspond to ecologically uh, speaking, it's up to you to make the interpretation, okay? It's a mixture model. And survival is 81% 80, 80, here. And we don't make any distinction between the, the classes, okay? So survival is the same for uh, class one and class two. We could test the model where we have uh, uh, heterogeneity both in the detection and survival process or in either of one of, of, uh, or just on detection or just on uh, survival. We could also test whether there, are, there is a transition between the two um, uh, classes. I mean, there are many possibilities and that's something that Sarah investigated in uh, her paper on gray wolves. So I encourage you to, to read her paper. That's a very nice paper. Okay. 
Um, well, graphical representation of the results. Let's skip that. Okay, um, a few uh, a few remarks on that. You may consider more classes. Huh? So far, we've only considered uh, two classes, but you could go for more classes. Like uh, you just have to define more uh, states. So alive in class one, class two, in class three, four, five, whatever. It's okay. Huh? And there is another paper by Sarah uh, who uh, investigated uh, um, the a way to select among among uh, the number of classes. How can you tell whether it's better to have two or three or more classes? Okay. You may also go for a non-parametric approach and let data tell you how many classes you need. And this is relatively easy to do in Nimble. Uh, see this paper by Daniel Trunk that uh, was just published. Um, okay, it's a bit technical, but it, everything is in Nimble and you just have to use that. Uh, and uh, it's available for capture recapture models and also for, for occupancy model. And there is more about individual heterogeneity in a, in a review paper we published some time ago with uh, Jean-Michel Gaillard, who is, uh, who is with us today, and Emmanuel Kahn, who is with us too, I think. Okay, um, so um, that's an important uh, slide. Huh? Um, hidden Markov models to analyze capture and recapture data. So the, the one thing that uh, um, it's one, well, it's, kind of uh, blew your mind when we, you really realized that is that with the same data, uh, let's take, for example, you remember detection on detection for gray wolves, we estimated survival, but with the same data, we can ask further questions. Just consider different states. So for the gray wolves example, we said, okay, we have uh, detecting non detecting alive and dead. That was a uh, SARS lecture. And in, in this lecture, we saw how to incorporate heterogeneity in the detection process just by uh, allowing the model to uh, go with more states, alive in class one, alive in class two, and dead. Okay, so that's just that's just um, I mean that's very very um, enlightening and uh, and using HMM to analyze capture and recapture can be very very uh, uh, satisfying in that respect. And the only limit is probably uh, our imagination. And uh, okay, that's that's uh, that's uh, a joke for those of you who like this uh, anime. Okay, and uh, one example of uh, how to use uh, HMM to uh, go a bit further in analyzing uh, in analyzing uh, capture capture data is is that one. And I, I'm going to spend uh, time is it? Let me check. Back. Okay, some time. I'm going to spend uh, five five minutes, I think, on that one. So is is this example how to make your models remember? So what's this? Uh, what is it about? You, so far, the dynamics of the the states are what we call first order of Mark Markovian. Oh, there is a typo again. Um, meaning that the site or the state where you will be okay, depends only on the site where you are, and not on the sites you were previously or the the states huh, you were previously. Okay, that's this Markovian uh, assumption we used. Uh, when we introduced the uh, HMM, uh, the, the hidden Markov models, okay? But it might be that uh, ecologically, uh, for some reasons, uh, we need to relax this assumption and go uh, second order Markovian, like the, the site or the state where you will be at T plus one depends on the site or the state where you are at T, but also on the state or site where you were at T minus one, okay? So it depends on two, Two previous on the two previous uh, two previous sampling state a uh, sampling occasion okay not only on the on the previous one okay how to do that it's fairly fairly it can be done with HMM with the basic HMM the first order uh, Markov uh, models we've seen so far and that's what I'm going to show you so these so-called memory models to say okay they have some memory whereas uh, first order Markovian models are what we call memoryless. They were initially proposed by a paper in the early 90s, the, the good years, um, by Esbeck and Esbeck and uh, Jay Hesbeck and, and colleagues and Cavell Browning in 93. Uh, and then they were formulated as a hidden mark of models by Lorian Rouen in her PhD. And uh, there is also this uh, paper by Diana, Diana Cole in 2014, where she investigates uh, issues with these uh, memory models and um, in a very nice way. Okay, let's have a look. Oop. 
Okay, you remember the, the model for dispersal between two sites? We have site A. What is, oh, that's the typo Chloe, uh, Chloe, uh, Chloe found. It's uh, ZT is A, B, and D. Okay, it's, it shouldn't be uh, one, two, three. A, B, and D. Site A, site B, and uh, you're dead. Okay. And so this is the transition matrix. You can survive on one side, on A side, and then do the transition between A and B or not, and die. And the observation matrix, given that you are alive in site A, B, C, uh, A, B, sorry, not C, C site C, but site, uh, well, you're dead. So alive in site A, alive in site B, or dead. And you are either non-detected, detected in site A, or detected and in site uh, B. So it's a copy and paste of, uh, of the slide we saw this morning. This should be P, B here. Okay. So that's the model we've seen so far. How to extend that one to say, okay, um, the transition probability not only depend on uh, what happened at T minus one, but also at T minus two. Okay, it needs a bit of a, a gymnastic or, or a brain gymnastic. That's how we say it. Yeah, that's how we say it this way. To keep track of the sites previously, uh, previously visited, the trick is to consider states as being pairs of sites occupied. Okay, so we're gonna keep track of pairs of sites. And this is how we're gonna be able to uh, um, go beyond the first order Markovian assumption, okay? And to, have, to put memory in, a, to give some memory to your, our model. So the states, piece of paper and pen, the states are the, uh, the following ones. We're gonna say, okay, AA is for alive inside A at T and alive inside A at T minus one, right? So pairs of sites. A, B is for live at site A at T and B at T minus one, B, A, blah, blah, B, B, so on. And D is for dead, right? Observations. It's the same observation as this morning. You are either non-detected, either detect or detected at site A or detected at site B, right? Okay, so the same data as before. It's just that the latent states are a bit different and the model is a bit different to account for this memory uh, process. Now, why do we need these, uh, these multi-event and uh, these uh, hidden Markov models? It's because the initial state probabilities are a bit uh, trickier to write down than in the standard capture uh, multi-state uh, model with two sites, alive uh, in A or alive in B. Now the states are the pairs of sites. You remember alive in, at uh, in A at T minus one, in A at T and so on. So we need to have, we don't know at, at in the initial state probability, we don't know uh, uh, whether before the, the, the initial uh, uh, probability, I mean initial state, uh, what state you were in. So we have to describe all of them and estimate the probability of being alive at initial, uh, the probability of your initial state being a, 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 B, B, A, and B, B, okay? So this is another case where we're gonna need, um, it's kind of, we have uh, five states now, and there is no way to my knowledge to, yeah, to decompose that, to have like binary events and uh, no, and avoid using the Dirichlet prior or the multinomial uh, logic link. We're gonna have to use uh, uh, one of them to be able to say, okay, each of these parameters is between zero and one, and the sum of, it, of them is one, okay? So that's why we use the Jewish prior or the multinomial logic link like Chloe, Chloe showed you this morning. Okay. So again, pi ij, uh, it's being at site j when first captured at t, and at site i at t minus one, okay? So at previous, uh, the, the occasion um, and the occasion before the first capture, we don't know your state. So that's why we need to have this vector delta of initial state probabilities, okay? They, we don't know them for sure, like in the multi-state uh, case. Now, the ugly part, the transition matrix. So we have five states, okay? So again, in rows, the dates of uh, the states of departure in columns, the date of uh, the states of arrival. And now we have five states. So it's a five by five uh, uh, matrix. And we uh, define phi i, j, k 
the probability to be inside k at t plus one for an individual present inside j at t and inside i at t minus one. Okay, so now the this big probability here accounts for what happened at the previous occasion and the uh, the two occasions before. Okay, at t and t minus one. And so you can fill in the matrix. Uh, so another uh, another parameterization which I find a bit more a bit more well a bit more um, easier to understand is that one. You define phi the probability of surviving from one occasion to the next, huh? and psi i j j uh, the probability that an animal stays at the same site j given that it was at site i on previous occasion. Okay, so by doing that, you can write down, oops, that's a T minus one here. You can write down the transition matrix as follow. Given that you were in state AA uh, at T minus one. Okay, so it means that you were in A at T minus two and in uh, A at T minus one. Uh, you're going to uh, be in state AA at T. So A at T minus one and A at T. Okay, with probability, the probability of surviving, and this psi probability. Okay, and the detection, uh, the the observation matrix. It's a bit easier to write that down because okay, we still have the three uh, observations non detected, detected in site one, site sorry, uh, site A, and detected in site B. The thing is that now we have five states at the same time occasion. Okay, so if you were in state AA at T, meaning that you were alive in site A at T minus one and alive at site A in <clears throat> at time T, uh, you're gonna apply the probability of being detected in site A, okay? Because you were alive in site A. Here, it's, you were alive at time T in B, so it's probability of B, of being alive in site B. Here, you were alive uh, at time t in A, so it's the probability of being detected as alive in state B at t. Okay, here B, so it's PB, right? Okay, so that's one way to account for memory in uh, in uh, in uh, in analyzing capture capture data. So there is a um, don't know if I. Did I mention that? No, that's uh, there is a nice uh, application of this uh, memory model on uh, flamingos, where uh, this person was uh, it was critical critical to um, to extend the model to account for the the sites where uh, flamingos were um, at the occasion the current I mean to 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 um, ah, to estimate the probability of being in a site at time uh, t plus one, it was really important to account for the site where you were at time t, so like you would do in a multi-state model, but also at t minus one, hence the use of this memory model. Okay. And there is a, there is a, this example is taken from, uh, from uh, this seminal paper by Roger Pradel, who introduced multi-event models in this biometrics paper. And the same idea, well, a similar idea was uh, introduced by uh, Jérôme Dupuis in this Biontica paper, where he extended the arneson schwarz model, so the really the, the landmark uh, uh, model by uh, by uh, Neil Arneson and, and Carl Schwartz, um, to account for uncertainty in state assignment. Uh, it was published in Biontica. The, the thing is that, well, this one, uh, Roger applied the maximum likelihood uh, estimation approach to estimate the parameters of, uh, of these models, uh, whereas Jérôme uh, used a, a Bayesian approach with a Gibbs sampling and everything. And uh, yeah, okay, so you have uh, those two papers. And we wrote kind of a review of these models uh, in the early, uh, well, in 2012. Um, and theoretical population biology, where we review those models and the applications. Okay. Live demo. Okay. Well, I have five minutes left, so I'm going to go through uh, this uh, demonstration. I just need to stop sharing and um, share again, but the whole screen now. Okay. And I'm going to go.
yeah i have five minutes left yeah six minutes left okay like demos okay so class seven the r script let's copy it oops open perfect oh that's uh, I'm, I'm i'm stupid that's the same uh, the same script as before Okay, so there is the part on the uh, house finch, and I'd like to go to the the wolf example. Yeah, how to incorporate um, heterogeneity in the detection process. So I'm just gonna maybe I need the wolf uh, data. Yeah, okay. Okay, should be there. Now, let's get rid of that. That. Let's have a look to the data. Okay. So it's just ones and zeros. Okay, so we have 87. That's weird. Okay. We have uh, 87 individuals um, over three, six, eight sampling occasions. Hmm. Okay, and uh, and they were either detected or non-detected, right? So the code, so we're gonna try to fit uh, the model we saw in the lecture where we have a constant survival and we have uh, heterogeneity in the detection process in that we uh, consider two classes of uh, detection, uh, of classes of uh, alive individuals and we apply detection, um, we distinguish the detection process according to uh, these two classes. So let's write down the model. Priors first, survival, well, these are all probabilities. So let's use a uniform distribution between zero and one. Survival, this is detection probability for uh, individuals alive in class one, for alive in class two, and this is the proportion of individuals newly marked in, uh, in the class one. Uh, the class one individuals. Okay. Then the transition matrix. So in that case, we don't uh, allow uh, to individuals to move from one class to the other. Okay. So we say, okay, if you are alive at t minus one in class one, you are alive in, in the same class at time t with probability phi, but you cannot, you cannot. Uh, be alive. I mean, you cannot uh, be in state uh, in state alive in class two at time t, given that you were in class uh, one at time t minus one. Okay, then the individuals are not allowed to move from one class to the other. That's uh, that's one model. And again, you could allow for transition between those two states and uh, test using uh, WIC uh, which one is uh, better describing your data. And then, uh, okay, the delta parameter. So now, again, it was a placeholder, blah, blah, blah. So now we need to say, okay, uh, initial state probability uh, alive in class one, the proportion uh, the probability is uh, pi, the probability of being alive at t, at, at in, uh, the probability of being initial state uh, alive in class one is pi, one minus pi one for alive um, in class two and dead, uh, I mean, the probability of being uh, initial state dead is zero. The observation matrix. Um, observation matrix, first index is for uh, states. So alive in class one, alive in class two, and dead. And the second index is for observation. So it's non-detected or detected. Mm -hmm. And so if you are alive at T uh, in class one, you are uh, the probability of being detected, or uh, non-detected, sorry, uh, is one minus P1. So we distinguish the detection probability according to the class you are in, okay, P1 or P2. And then as before, we need to say, okay, at first encounter, detection is one. Uh, so we set, uh, we, we define the same matrix here, omega observation matrix, but for first encounter, and we say P1 is equal to P2 is equal to one. You replace those parameters by one and you get this matrix, okay? It's just to deal with the first encounter, the observation at first encounter, which is by definition, uh, which gives a detection equals one by definition, okay? First encounter. And the likelihood is the same as uh, in the 
in the Sutishi water or the house finch example. That's the same like load. We just need to uh, um, take care of the indexing. Delta has three components. Uh, omega has two columns and gamma has three columns because we have three states. Okay, and two columns because we have only two uh, observations. We could make that a bit more, I mean, kind of automatic or dynamic. We could adjust to the to the to the number of the states we define or the number of observations we have by taking the dimensions of the matrix. But yeah, okay. It's also cool to have to double check here that we have the right dimensions. Okay, so let's uh, pass the model. Consent data initial values. Okay, parameters to save and and the model fitting. Okay. Uh huh. Half past three. Okay, it shouldn't take too long. So let's wait. Too long. Oh, and for initial values here, for the latent state, what we do is that we say, okay, uh, oh yeah, at first encounter, we don't know the, the state, huh, of course, so we just uh, 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 pick at random, either alive in state one or in state two, okay? And it's a bit different. Oh yeah, I do it a bit differently from using the sample function. I use the R multinom function, and I say, okay, uh, ah, it's running. Uh, pick one or two at random. So just before we have a look to the results, our multinom, this one here, let's have a look. You see it generates, that's really a multinomial distribution here in that case. It's a bit different from the the category. The It's, it's the same thing as a categorical distribution. So we have two probabilities. We end up with uh, either the first category alive in class one or the second category of the multinomial alive in class two. And this is what uh, this vector tells us. So it's for this one, it's uh, class two. This one in class one, class two, class one, class one, class one, and so on. So then I just apply the which and say, okay, where is the one? And so if you do that, it tells you, okay, it's category one. So it's class one class one, class one, and of course, ah, class two, okay? So we randomly pick a value for the state, uh, the initial uh, values for the states, okay? Using this, uh, which are metinomial. Let's have a look to the results, clack, clack. Oh, and that's an interesting thing because in the lecture, we had the reverse results. We had that P1 was lower than P2. And it's okay, it's definitely fine because the model doesn't make any difference between P1 and P2, it's, it's up to us to interpret it. So we had that P1 was uh, 38 or something like that, and P2 was uh, 50%, so it was the reverse, but that's okay because now survival is the same. No? Uh, we don't make any difference between the classes. And pi is tells you which one is one is which. So uh, this is the... Um, the proportion of, of uh, newly marked individuals in uh, class one, and class one is the one with uh, high detection probabilities. But it was the reverse for, in the lecture, I think pi was uh, around 60%, and it was telling you, okay, it was 60% in class, uh, in this, in the class with detection probability 30%, okay? So by carefully expecting the reasons, we can just uh, find, uh, find the, it's the same thing. Okay, and then it's up to you to interpret. Uh, there is uh, um, there is uh, some individuals that are highly capturable and others that are lowly detectable for some reasons that uh, you need to uh, connect to the ecology of the species. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, yeah three thirty four and. Uh, so let's have a break. That was the plan. Yeah, that was the plan. So let's have a break until 4 p.m. Uh, and let's uh, let's uh, 
gather again at 4 p.m. for the last lecture, and then we'll uh, we'll close the workshop with some take-home messages. But and Perry will uh, will give uh, his lecture on uh, on uh, how to use Nimble uh, in uh, like advanced mode. Okay. See you in uh, at 4 p.m.
Okay, we are back for the last lecture. And uh, Perry will, uh, will tell you everything about uh, advanced use of, uh, of Nimble. Perry, are you, are you here? Yeah. You don't have your mic on. Yeah. Like yeah, it's much better. Yeah. It's, it's warmer than yesterday, no? <laughs> uh, not much. <laughs> Wearing more layers. So you <laughs> like get I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's cold in, in this unused building. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but the floor is yours. Really to do it. Yeah. yeah. The floor is yours. Go ahead and uh, okay. let me know if you need right. anything. Yeah, here we go. Thanks, Olivier. All right. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, staying on and joining for this. Let's see. Um, I need to share my, my screen. So I'm Perry de Valpine, and uh, uh, I guess you could say I, I started Nimble, and, and we've had a, a core group of developers with uh, Chris Pat Turek uh, really started it. Uh, we started it together, and Daniel Turek was part of it uh, really from the very early stages. And uh, so we're kind of the core development team, and then we've had a variety of uh, postdocs and programmers contributing to it, and you can uh, see all that on our website. And so this uh, final section will be uh, uh, more about uh, getting inside of Nimble and seeing the steps and all the customizations that you can do with it. Uh, and so the emphasis will be on the software more than the statistical models. So, so far, uh, we have used a Nimble workflow using the Nimble MCMC function uh, shown over here, where we are giving the uh, model inputs, the, the language, uh, the bugs language or model code as we call it, the data in its and constants, and uh, going straight to Nimble MCMC to do everything in one call. Um, and actually that was not, uh, we, we added that function uh, later because people wanted a single call. But really the way the software is designed is that there's a, a sequence of steps you can go through uh, where you build a model object and then you can use that in R, you can uh, program with that, you can debug uh, your model uh, with that. You, uh, then there's a, a step of configuring in MCMC and you can customize that configuration. You can add and remove samplers. Uh, clearly that involves you know, a little more advanced um, knowledge of uh, uh, MCMC strategies. And yet it's something uh, you can either uh, learn about yourself or if that's not something you have time or inclination for, you can find a collaborator uh, to work with potentially. And uh, it can be something that can lead to uh, pretty dramatic improvements in MCMC efficiency. And then there's a step of building the MCMC algorithm itself, compiling the model in the MCMC and running them. So you really have a lot of control. And in fact, Nimble is not just an MCMC engine. It's really uh, designed as a system for programming uh, algorithms, what we call model generic algorithms. That is uh, statistical methods that can work with a range of model structures in a generic way. So the steps to use Nimble uh, fully are to uh, build the model. It's an R object, so you can, you can uh, work with it, query it, look at variables, change variables, calculate parts of the model, simulate parts of the model, and so on. Build the MCMC, compile those, uh, run, run them, and extract the samples. So, so far, we've been seeing Nimble MCMC do this all at once. And we are gonna uh, go back to the Dipper example so that uh, here we can uh, hopefully feel familiar with the example and focus on the, the code and the software steps. Okay, so just to uh, warm, uh, warm everybody up after um, potentially a long workshop day, here we are with the, the Dipper um, code where uh, we have uh, transitions from uh, basically being alive to still being alive and being alive to being dead. Uh, dead to alive doesn't happen, dead to dead happens. And then uh, detection probabilities. Okay, so, um, you know, such a classic uh, example and so handy uh, for running. So this is what we've seen uh, Nimble MCMC to run all of this, provide all the inputs at once and there it goes. Okay, uh, 
so now we're going to break the steps down. Uh, so we can build the model using the nimble model function. And this is the first thing that nimble MCMC does, uh, more or less. And to do this, you provide the code, your code, and your constants for sure. You can provide the data and the initial values, and many people find it convenient to do that. Uh, 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 but it's not strictly necessary here. The constants are what are needed to define the model. Uh, those are things like uh, vectors of indices and um, you know, something like n where you might have a for loop for i and one to n. Then uh, you'll uh, build the MCMC. And really there are two steps to this. There is making the configuration and then building the MCMC. And by configuration, uh, a good way to think of this is uh, if you're going to build an engine for a car, uh, first you're going to make a list of the parts you want, and then you're going to study that list and maybe refine it, and then you're going to order all the parts and put the car together. Okay, so the configuration is the list of parts. It's a list of which parts of the model will be sampled by which MCMC sampling strategy. And you can really think of MCMC as uh, a family of algorithms. Uh, there are many different approaches to uh, 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 generating posterior samples. And there is not really a universally best way uh, to do MCMC uh, yet across all uh, possible models. There's such a huge diversity of models in you know, all, all kinds of fields of hierarchical statistical modeling. And so really uh, the best MCMC strategies at this point are you know, problem specific. Uh, so you, you make a, make a, a configuration, and then with that configuration, and, and you see the samplers. Oh, so let's let's look at these. Uh, so we see what's going to be monitored, what the thinning interval is. Those can be uh, changed. When we see RW sampler, that means that the uh, survival and detection probability will be sampled with, this is shorthand for a random walk sampler. That's really shorthand for a uh, Metropolis Hastings sampler with random walk proposals, that is proposals um, centered on the current value in the chain. And it's actually an adaptive random walk Metropolis Hastings sampler. So at that point, we get a pretty good mouthful to describe that thing. Uh, and so we just uh, abbreviate it as a random walk sampler. Uh, there are some latent state uh, nodes that are uh, posterior predictive nodes. So that has a name, a posterior predictive sampler. And the ones that follow a categorical distribution get a categorical sampler. And uh, there are some situations where people set up, in other kinds of ecological models, sometimes people set up uh, categorical uh, distributions with many, many, many categories. And it can be important to know that the sampling in those cases can be somewhat inefficient because the sampler uh, actually needs to try every category, whether it's uh, in Nimble or JAGS. Uh, so then you compile the model. Uh, and I don't know if it's been discussed what that really means. What it means is that Nimble generates C++ for your model and compiles that under the hood and loads that back into R so that it can use it. Um, and that's why when you installed Nimble, there needed to be a step of ensuring that you had a C++ compiler and associated tools installed on Windows, the R tools, um, uh, and uh, on Mac uh, probably uh, you did that with Xcode with command line tools. Uh, and then you can compile the MCMC. You can do those in one line, uh, but if you do them in two lines, which is a convenient workflow, you'll get, um, uh, uh, you'll have to tell the MCMC what model it's connected to, and you do that with this project statement so that the MCMC can be connected to the model. Okay. And then uh, you can run the MCMC. Uh, uh, like this, and there's even a slightly lower level way to do it that's shown in the comments here. Okay. Uh, and you can get the samples back as a list if you choose, uh, but our default is as the matrix that you've been familiar with from the workshop so far. So one important thing uh, that uh, often goes by um, unnoticed, I think, at first use, uh, especially when people are perhaps coming from other tools, is that uh, everything can be executed uh, without compiling or with compiling. Uh, without compiling, things will be very painfully slow, but you can debug things as if you're running an R because you are running an R. 
and uh, and then then you can compile and run for fast execution. Okay, so here are uh, the results, and I will uh, not dwell on these because uh, we're focusing on the software. But this is just to see uh, that the results came through uh, when we broke down uh, the steps: nimble model, configure MCMC, build MCMC, compile the model in the MCMC, and then run the MCMC. So why is it useful to be able to break these pieces down? Okay, this is going to be uh, just a quick a quick overview of uh, some of the ways this is useful. Uh, so first of all, you can use and debug the model in R, and you can do that with either the uh, uncompiled or the compiled model. And so, for example, you make uh, your model. Uh, I think this is the uncompiled one. And then just like you're familiar with an R for a list or uh, another kind of uh, object in R, a dollar sign will access a variable in that. And you can see the current value of the gamma matrix. And then there are a set of uh, methods. Um, uh, in in object-oriented programming, the word method simply refers to a function that uh, is associated with an object and will uh, work with the, uh, the, the data in that object. And so the calculate method will calculate uh, the model in order and what the number returned from it is the sum of all of the log probability calculations in the model, uh, log uh, likelihood components and log probabilities of latent states and of priors. Uh, there are also methods, uh, there's a simulate uh, method uh, that's, that's handy. So if you want to run a simulation study with a model written in Nimble, uh, you can use the simulate method. And you can provide arguments to control uh, which parts you want to simulate or calculate. So let's just have a quick look. Um, let's suppose that we uh, made a mistake in providing initial values. And in our initial values, uh, we accidentally made a dead bird come alive again. And so when we do the, the calculate without any argument, it it's calculates the entire model and we see a minus int, uh, which is a negative infinity. And that's because that's the log of zero probability because we had something that can't happen and is defined to have zero probability in the transition matrix. And so then we may find ourselves wanting to track down what, what the heck happened. We have no idea where, where our mistake was, where our bug was. And so uh, we can start to, to delve through uh, uh, the pieces of the model. So we could say maybe the problem is in the latent states. Let's just calculate the probabilities of those. And indeed, we'd see, ah, there, there's a minus infinity coming from there. And then we could start breaking down uh, and looking at parts of the model uh, and calculate, for example, the, the uh, probabilities or, well, all the, all the steps for uh, the fifth row of Z or the sixth row of Z, which correspond to the fifth and sixth birds. And I've just concatenated those together. And by doing that, we'd see that oh, for the fifth bird, there's a valid calculation. Uh, for the sixth bird, we see that minus int, so there must be some problem there. And then we could inspect uh, the variable Z, the sixth row of that, and then we could see, oh, somehow we, our code accidentally generated uh, a dead bird, a uh, two coming back to a one, uh, the model would give that a zero probability or a minus in, uh, log probability. And so we've tracked down the problem. We've debugged our model and we can go fix the input. Uh, I will point out that um, there's uh, something curious going on here where these are character strings uh, in the format of, you know, in the, in the syntax of our code, the way we'd uh, index a variable in R. And, and that's similar to, uh, you know, the column names of the MCMC uh, output matrix. And uh, there's quite a bit more you can do with a model object. You can use it to query uh, what's connected to what in the model, what we call the dependencies, uh, to find out the names of the nodes in the model. We call the node, we call a, when there's a declaration in the model code, a line of model code, we call that a declaration. And each one of those creates a node or a set of nodes if it's in a for loop. And you can find out what those are and you can do a lot of probing in the model and uh, learn about that in our user manual that you can find on our website. So uh, one of the things we can do in terms of the algorithms is to open the hood uh, and change and modify the MCMC samplers that are being used. Uh, we can even write new samplers with our nimble function programming system, uh, which it will not be covered today. 
uh, but is quite feasible to do. Uh, so uh, let's give, uh, we'll, ha we'll have an, as an example. Uh, well, what are some of the samplers that we might want to use? Uh, so for, you know, basic choice for uh, univariate sampling of parameters in a model are to use either what are called slice samplers uh, or Metropolis Hastings, which is again, adaptive random walk Metropolis Hastings samplers. Uh, as it happens, JAGS often defaults to slice samplers and Nimble often defaults to Metropolis Hastings samplers, but you can configure those in JAGS, in, uh, excuse me, in Nimble as much as you want. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to sample a parameter on a log scale and you know, there's a parameter transformation there that needs to be accounted for and that's handled in our sampler. Um, and that's especially handy uh, for a, a parameter that's either a variance or a standard deviation or a precision. You know, one of those are the typical ways to parameterize, you know, or, or alternative ways to parameterize the same part of a model. Uh, it's also handy to block correlated parameters. What we mean is parameters that are correlated in the posterior, actually correlated uh, conditioned on values of everything else in the model. And blocking the word blocking in the context of a sampler simply means um, uh, sampling or updating uh, multiple dimensions in the same MCMC step. Okay, so uh, there is a help, a help page uh, within Nimble uh, to learn about all the built-in samplers. And then in the user manual, you can learn about writing new samplers. Uh, our algorithm programming system is all uh, in R. So the source code for samplers and distributions is in R and can be copied and modified. And in the worksheet for this, which uh, we'll see if we get to, there's an example of doing that, uh, not for a sampler, but for uh, a marginalization function that we'll use in the model. And we do have a package uh, that's not yet on CRAN, but does work. And there's a link here to uh, the GitHub uh, site uh, called Compare MCMCs that uh, helps you to manage comparison among MCMC uh, methods, if that's of interest to you. Um, that used to be part of Nimble, but Nimble grew so large that we've made some effort to carve out uh, what are some distinct pieces and compare MCMCs as one of those to be a separate package. So let's consider a model uh, with uh, wing length and individual uh, random effect on survival. So this will be the dipper model extended with an explanatory variable and a random effect. Uh, so here we are, uh, we're going to make uh, uh, the logit of uh, survival for individual i be a linear uh, function, uh, an intercept plus a slope uh, times uh, wing length for individual i, uh, plus a random effect for individual i, which is declared to follow a normal distribution. I use the word declared uh, because the language, the, the model language here is a declarative language it means that it doesn't matter what order you declare you that the lines appear in, they just they just need to be uh, the lines need to appear somewhere uh, so that everything is covered in the model. So the way I think of the code is that every line of code is drawing uh, some uh, circles and arrows on a gigantic whiteboard, and the only important thing is that by the end of the code, all of the circles and arrows that we need have been drawn. It doesn't matter what order they're drawn in. Uh, what is uh, relevant for me to say here, well, okay, first of all, let's see that uh, there's a fundamental change now because now the transition probabilities are specific for each individual. So the gamma matrix picks up an index I and becomes a three-dimensional array with uh, the survival for individual I because that has its own wing length and its own random effect. And then, down in the categorical uh, state transition part of the model, that index i appears uh, there as well. Uh, for, for all kinds of model components like this with a random effect, there's a basic choice between uh, what's called a centered and uncentered parameterization. So here the random effect is given a mean of zero and then is added to uh, other uh, pieces that are contributing to uh, the survival for individual phi, uh, individual i. Uh, an alternative when there's a single random effect would be to say that logit phi i follows a normal distribution. And here is the mean, the, the, the intercept plus slope times wing length uh, with the, the standard deviation uh, SD eps. And 
uh, those two alternative parameterizations can and do lead to different mixing uh, uh, efficiencies. And there isn't a universally best uh, choice. It really depends on the model and the data. But what is important to know is if you have a time series model, uh, for example, a state space model, uh, and really these are a form of uh, state space model for individuals. Uh, if you make a long sequence of deterministic um, declarations from one time to the next, uh, that can become quite inefficient. Uh, that's a bit of a side comment. Uh, but you do see code written that way, for example, for state space models, uh, and and that can be inefficient. So here's a trace plot just of 5,000 out of uh, 10,000 iterations for the standard deviation parameter with two chains. We can see it's not mixing wonderfully well. Uh, that's, a, that's a picture of not uh, great mixing. Uh, and it's, uh, this run just visually doesn't appear long enough to me with that quality of mixing uh, that it, to, to be something we'd rely upon. But our goal here is just to simply see how we'd change samplers and uh, you know, a little uh, warning, this isn't gonna give a magical improvement in this case. It's just the simplest example uh, that we wanted uh, to show of how to start to experiment in this way. So uh, when we see the configuration uh, for this model, uh, we see the adaptive random walk metropolis hasting centers for uh, these uh, various uh, parts of the model. And in particular, we're gonna focus on the standard deviation of the epsilons. Uh, very often the slowest uh, mixing parameters in a model are either uh, something like standard deviation of epsilon, a, a, a random effect standard deviation or variance or precision, uh, or uh, sometimes uh, an intercept or one of the coefficients of a model are the slowest mixing. So here we go, we can take our configuration, uh, we can look in the Nimble documentation, uh, either in the package or in the user manual that's online on our website, and we can remove uh, the samplers for uh, the default sampler for the standard deviation of epsilon. And we can add a new sampler. And when we do that, the language of MCMC is that the uh, target node is the node being sampled. And we can give it a slice sampler. Uh, and now we can see in our configuration that we have a slice sampler on that node, on that part of the model. Uh, and we can go ahead, then we go through the same steps that are not shown where we'd uh, build the MCMC, compile, and run, uh, and we'd uh, see a new trace plot. Now, uh, and it's, again, it doesn't mix wonderfully. Uh, it's just the very simplest example within a model that is uh, already familiar from the workshop. Uh, so, so then how do we decide which is uh, better, actually? And so it's important to realize that MCMC efficiency uh, depends on both the mixing, that is the picture of the chain bouncing up and down, um, uh, moving around its posterior effectively, and the computation time it takes to achieve that mixing. So we've uh, typically defined MCMC efficiency as the effective sample size divided by the computation time. And so what does that mean? Uh, we interpret that as the number of effectively independent posterior samples generated per second. So, and by effectively independent, what we mean is uh, kind of how much uh, statistical information is there in those posterior samples. Uh, so the ESS is going to be different for each parameter because the parameters will, will display different mixing. Uh, but the computation time is the same because that's uh, for running the entire MCMC. So what you'll have is a different numerator for each, uh, one for each parameter, and then the same denominator. And effective sample size itself is something that uh, people have given a lot of careful thought to, uh, to uh, in terms of how to estimate it. It's something that is its own statistical estimation problem, and there are different methods for doing it, uh, and you can, you can get some of those different methods uh, in the CODA package, uh, or the MCMC SE for standard error package. Okay. And those are statistical estimates and different runs will give different chains and you'll get different statistical estimates of ESS. So you'll get different uh, estimates of efficiency. In this case with the default sampler, we get an ESS of 25.7 divided by a computation time of 21.53. And with the slice sampler, it's a little bit worse because uh, uh, the, uh, well, the mixing is a little bit worse. And 
uh, I want to I want to point out that uh, actually when I ran this example on on my machine, uh, it was flipped and the slice sampler was you know moderately more efficient. And uh, this isn't highly representative in that. Um, the and it, so so uh, these results come from Olivier's machine, and it's possible that we ran things slightly differently. Uh, the slice sampler normally takes more computation time because it does do more model calculations per iteration. So this is kind of unusual here, uh, and then it usually achieves a little bit better mixing. Uh, so it's usually a bigger denominator, bigger numerator over a bigger denominator, uh, and compared to the uh, default random walk metropolis hastings sampler and uh, sometimes one or the other is more efficient when that trade-off between mixing and computation time is all taken together what what we usually do when we're comparing these uh, for our own uh, purposes of interest is to ignore the model building and compilation time and focus on the actual execution time because that really gets to the algorithm runtime and we're interested in cases usually that are running for, you know, like hours or sometimes days uh, or at least many minutes uh, for big complicated models where that's really what dominates the cost of the whole thing. Uh, uh, and we're less interested in the software nuts and bolts of the uh, compilation and building steps. Okay. So what about blocking? This is another uh, strategy uh, available to easily try. We provide a couple of different block samplers. Uh, one is an adaptive random walk Metropolis Hastings block sampler, where it will make multivariate proposals from a multivariate normal. And the adaptation tries to learn both a good uh, scale for the proposal um, proposals, as well as a good uh, uh, correlation matrix for those. Uh, we also provide a block version of uh, slice sampling, um, which uh, can be fairly computationally costly uh, and can mix well. Uh, often the computational cost uh, outweighs the mixing, but in some cases it's a winner. Uh, so this, this picture uh, shows the posterior for the slope and intercept. And actually this picture doesn't display very clearly uh, posterior correlation between these. However, what's really important to remember is that this is a marginal posterior. That is, uh, all the other dimensions of the model are not shown. They're, this picture is collapsed over those other dimensions. And the real issue for whether block sampling will be helpful is whether there is posterior correlation uh, for these two parameters when everything else is held fixed, which is what's happening during the course of uh, the chain sampling. So let's anyway, just see how to set this up. We would again, remove samplers uh, for beta one and beta two and add a sampler where the target is both of those together and the type is specified as random walk block. And in fact, it's valid MCMC uh, to have both. You don't have to remove the old samplers in either of these examples. Uh, typically people have one sampler updating, uh, you know, have each dimension of the model updated by one and only one sampler. But sometimes an effective sampling strategy for slow mixing parts of a model can be to have multiple samplers uh, that are updating uh, that part of a model. And that is uh, perfectly valid within MCMC. So now we see the random walk block sampler appear there. Uh, and uh, we're not showing results from running this in the interest of time. Uh, so uh, let's have a summary of strategies for improving MCMC. So one, one good strategy is to choose uh, reasonable initial values. Uh, a reason for that is that with the uh, random walk samplers that are the default, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, sorry, got distracted. Uh, with the random walk samplers that are uh, the default, the adaptation uh, begins to occur based on uh, kind of the information about the posterior uh, uh, resulting from the initial iterations of the and the initial iterations happen in a, a very um, a part of the posterior that's not really representative of the part that's of interest then that adaptive or self-tuning may not work well and in addition it may just take a while for the chain to find its way to the relevant part of the posterior uh, and 
Uh, I think largely because I think slice samplers uh, often do better at quickly getting to the relevant part of the posterior, not always. Uh, and so that's one reason that based on default samplers, people experience nimble as having a little more sensitivity to initial values. And since in practice, it's almost never the case that someone just sets up a model, I'd say virtually never the case, sets up a model, runs it, and they're done. <laughs> then in practice, uh, based on your uh, runs as you're getting things sorted out and getting things working, uh, even if you have no idea what decent initial values are to begin, uh, you will, from your initial runs, uh, uh, learn some values that are healthy to put in. OK, you can customize the sampler choice, and there's more in our user manual. Uh, it's worth considering reparameterizing, uh, sort of regardless of the type of MCMC you're using. Standardizing covariates can be helpful and uh, removing uh, parameter redundancies. It can also be effective to think about rewriting the model. Uh, the way the model is written can make a big difference in both computational efficiency and uh, 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 sometimes mixing. Uh, so one uh, point is that Nimble does support a vectorized model statements uh, more flexibly, I think, than, um, uh, than JAGs or WinBugs, uh, as I understand it. And so you can make, uh, uh, you can, you can make uh, deterministic declarations that are uh, uh, vectorized, uh, meaning they, they work for a, uh, a vector or a matrix of a variable uh, jointly, what you need to be careful about, well, so let me give you uh, an example. If people are familiar with say spatial capture recapture modeling, there are calculations of the distance between uh, each uh, latent activity center and each detector or uh, camera trap or whatever uh, is being used. Uh, and those distances often can be uh, vectorized in Nimble. You can calculate all the distances from one activity center to all the detectors in one declaration instead of putting them in a for loop uh, with a separate calculation for each one. What you want to be careful about is to think about uh, the sequence of calculations. The model, what the model really does is define an ordered set of calculations. And when an MCMC algorithm is operating, when it's going to update one stochastic node, it needs to calculate everything that either that node depends on or that depends on that node. Code. And so if you vectorize, you want to make sure that you only vectorize things that will already be calculated together anyway, because they depend on the same things. Uh, otherwise, uh, you'd be creating extra calculation that might not need to happen. Okay, it's helpful to avoid long chains of deterministic dependencies, uh, which I mentioned uh, previously. And then what we'll focus on next is that you can uh, write new functions and new distributions uh, in our Nimble Function Programming System, which you do from R that looks and feels like R and just has this uh, special label because you need, it's, it's uh, really a, a specialized subset of R, basically math and distributions and basic flow control like if, then, else, and for loops and some type declarations and that's all so that we can include it in what we compile, what we generate to C++ code to run your models efficiently. Okay. And it's really crucial to see that, uh, you know, in programming in general, uh, you know, the word extensible refers to you can take a system and you can, you can uh, make it work in new ways. Uh, so we look at uh, the uh, previous implementations of the bugs model language from the original uh, WinBugs, OpenBugs, and JAGs as closed languages in that uh, you can't extend what functions and distributions are available in any easy way. You'd have to dive deeply into the level source code to do that. And we have uh, tried to make it uh, so that from R you can extend the language and that can often uh, be a route to a lot of efficiency. Okay, so you can write new samplers uh, not covered. Uh, that's particularly helpful for particular model structures. Like if you have a model structure that imposes a constraint, uh, then a sampler, a custom sampler can be an effective way to respect that constraint. Uh, and you can parallelize Nimble. Uh, and we have an example on our set of examples at our home, at our, uh, at our, at our website, our nimble.org. Uh, I will say that uh, unfortunately in parallelization, uh, you need to 
basically for each thread include the model building and MCMC building and compilation. Uh, so that uh, adds some overhead to each thread. Uh, that is something we hope to improve in the future, but that's the current state of parallelizing. Okay, so uh, let's write a user-defined distribution as we call it to extend Nimble to integrate over the latent states. Uh, it does mean that we will not uh, get posterior samples from those latent states. It's possible to do that uh, after the fact uh, but this would be particularly useful if that's not what you're interested in and you're interested in the, uh, the uh, demographic parameters, for example. Marginalization often, uh, but not always, improves MCMC. We have a recent paper led by Lauren Panicio uh, uh, looking at uh, marginalization from the Nimble Ecology package for uh, occupancy, dynamic occupancy, and, and mixture models uh, in Nimble. And so you can go there to see examples where marginalization can improve uh, MCMC efficiency by over an order of magnitude. So, uh, you know, for example, the difference between waiting a day versus a couple of weeks for something to run, um, uh, and cases where, it, where the marginalization is actually more computationally costly than the mixing benefit it provides. Uh, and an example of that is an N mixture model where the marginalization is computationally heavy, so it's more effective more efficient to actually just sample those latent states uh, in an N mixture model. Okay, so Nimble Ecology provides uh, these marginalized distributions for uh, CJS models and hidden Markov models, time dependent and independent, as well as occupancy and dynamic occupancy and N mixture. So here's our model, uh, just uh, narrowing down to the state transition part of the code. Uh, so here uh, are the uh, the initial state uh, the initial states and then the state transitions from the categorical distribution, pulling out a row of the uh, transition matrix to get the probabilities of being in each state at time t based on the state at time t minus one, and then uh, here's the observation part of the model. So we've seen this uh, previously. In Nimble uh, Ecology with our marginalized distribution, here's what the code would look like. Uh, we, would, um, we would look at the, uh, uh, the entire capture history for individual I from the time after the first capture, the way this model is set up, uh, to the final time. Uh, we'd look at that as a multivariate random variable uh, so a, a vector uh, of outcomes uh, that come from the distribution defined by a hidden Markov model. And the inputs to that or the parameters for that are the, uh, uh, the vector of initial probabilities. That is, what are the probabilities of being in states one to four uh, at, the, at the start? The, uh, the matrix of uh, observation um, uh, probabilities uh, from each state to each observation state, the transition matrix. Uh, we need to give it the length of the series, which uh, uh, looks and in fact is a little bit redundant, but is necessary. And we have a, an option there to check uh, uh, if you wanna uh, have this uh, automatically check whether the uh, rows of each of the matrices sum to one as they should, uh, uh, you can do that if you set it to zero, then they won't be checked and that'll be some teeny bit more efficient. Uh, there is a subtle issue here, uh, which uh, I didn't correct in the slides, but um, if we get to, we, uh, we may run out of time, but if we get to walk through the uh, worksheet code, I will show, uh, I'll at least flash that up, uh, which is that uh, any time that a, model variable is used as an index. So for example, here, an element of Y is used as part of the index of gamma. Then Nimble in figuring out what is connected to what in the model needs to say, well, the initial, this, this vector in it I one to four uh, come from this declaration. When does that need to be uh, recalculated well, potentially any time this Y index uh, changes. Well, this uh, we know is never gonna change 
but Nimble doesn't know that unless we give it to it as part of the constants in the model. That's how we tell Nimble this will never change. Uh, and what is confusing or complicated in this case is that the rest of the Y matrix is uh, not constants. It's uh, data or uh, 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 latent state. And so uh, a workaround or a trick to do this would be to make another copy of Y, call it, perhaps call it constant Y, and provide that in the constants list as an input. And here use constant Y. And that will tell Nimble, this is never changing. And when it figures out what depends on what, what needs to be calculated when, uh, it, it will be useful to know that that never changes. Okay. In this particular model, it actually will not really matter uh, because um, uh, of the rest of, of the model structure. OK, so uh, anyway, this runs about twice as fast as uh, the standard formulation. And marginalizing typically gives better mixing. So that's going to improve. Uh, that's going to make the numerator of the efficiency higher, better ESS from better mixing, and the denominator smaller, uh, uh, faster runtime. OK. Uh, OK, how about the possibility of reducing redundant calculations? OK. So, so far, we've been working with uh, the data where each row of the data is for an individual animal uh, or um, uh, organism of whatever kind. Uh, however, in a, in a simple model like this, you could have multiple individuals that share identical encounter histories. Uh, and if there are M of those individuals, uh, what we'd really like to do is have uh, the likelihood contribution be the likelihood uh, or the probability of that encounter history simply raised to the power m, rather than calculating it m times uh, redundantly, which can add a lot of computational cost. So uh, we call this a weighted likelihood approach. And in, this, uh, in some cases, that can really decrease the computational uh, burden quite a lot. Uh, and that idea has been used in uh, previous computer programs that do maximum likelihood for uh, hidden Markov models or hidden multi-event, multi-state uh, capture capture models. Uh, in the Bayesian framework, uh, we did it, Daniel Turek is a, a core Nimble developer, um, and we did it uh, in a paper on efficient uh, MCMC sampling for hidden Markov models in 2016 using uh, Nimble, uh, not in the exact uh, same form now, but uh, more or less uh, similar results. Uh, and we can't do that in JAGS because the model language is closed. We need to uh, provide a new distribution in Nimble that uh, provides that, that can handle this weighted likelihood. And this uh, can really run uh, much faster in cases where there's a lot of redundant encounter histories and can allow us to fit models to big data sets. The worksheet has an example of doing this for uh, a famous Canada Goose data set that's quite large with a lot of redundancy, individuals with identical encounter histories. There are three spatial locations uh, in that model. Uh, and so that provides a nice example of this. We used that example in the Turek et al. paper. And it, as things were set up there, uh, the efficiency of Nimble uh, with marginalized likelihoods and weighted likelihoods compared to JAGS uh, was about 800 to 1,000 fold more efficient. Uh, so that was the difference between running uh, quite reasonably and being almost unusable uh, in JAGS. OK, uh, there is a worksheet. What I'm going to do is uh, jump to uh, one or two final slides and then uh, jump to some highlights of the worksheet Worksheet in our remaining, I think we have about 15 minutes or so, a little bit under. OK, so I just wanted to comment uh, for those of you who are interested on some future directions in Nimble. Uh, Nimble continues to be under active development. It's an open source uh, software package. Uh, we'd love uh, contributors, people to get involved, uh, including if, if it sounds cool and interesting and you're, you know, you're interested in uh, open source uh, scientific software development, but uh, maybe you don't have any idea <laughs> what you'd contribute to or how you'd get involved. And if you want to reach out, uh, there are lots of parts of the system just waiting for time and effort uh, for someone to get into. Uh, it's also possible for uh, you, as, as a number of people have done and are doing, to uh, do something like Nimble Ecology, that is provide your own tools uh, on top, uh, provide your own R package that uses Nimble internally. 
Um, uh, so uh, we want to, uh, the Nimble development team wants to improve uh, the speed of building models and algorithms and make it easier to save and reload compiled work. We know that it's a bit burdensome to need to go through those steps each time uh, you reload into a new R session. Uh, we uh, have made a lot of progress supporting automatic differentiation uh, with a C++ library. And uh, that's a that's a, a fancy way of saying uh, that we'll be able to automatically provide derivatives for all model calculations. And that's a trick that enables uh, methods like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and Laplace approximation in any reasonably efficient way. So we uh, anticipate uh, providing those uh, types of algorithms in Nimble as well. Uh, we're also uh, hoping one day to uh, provide some tools to make it easier to build packages that use Nimble under the hood, so to speak. Uh, and some, some references, the Turek et al. paper uh, that we referred to and the Panicio et al. paper that we referred to. We do have a Nimble workshop coming up at the, the end of Wednesday through Friday next week. That's 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. North American time. Uh, uh, that one is uh, uh, not free like this one, uh, but uh, if you uh, can't contribute to the cost, uh, you can simply uh, fill out the short uh, statement uh, to say you can't contribute to the cost and uh, there shouldn't be a problem in being able to attend without paying. Uh, if you can contribute to the cost, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Um, and there's a lot of workshop material online uh, available. Uh, let's see, uh, what I want to point you to, so we have an Nimble manual and a cheat sheet. In addition, if you go to our GitHub site, which I'm showing here uh, and go to the bottom, uh, if you click on workshop materials, you'll get to a GitHub site that has many of our previous workshop materials. And there's a lot there uh, that you can sort through, including, this is a little bit out of date, but all the JAGS examples from uh, uh, Mark Carey and Andy Royal's Applied Hierarchical Modeling Volume 1 book have been converted to Nimble, uh, which doesn't take much effort. Um, and so uh, you can find those. Okay, uh, I think then uh, while I'm uh, switching over, uh, Olivier or anyone else can uh, steer me if I should do something different. Uh, but my yes. thought will, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you wanted to go through the worksheet, that's, that's it? That's the idea? Yeah, uh, what? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. So uh, I'm gonna share, here we go. Okay, so this is not our studio. This is uh, Emacs uh, running ESS Emacs Speaks Statistics. Um, somebody tell me if it should be larger or is in any way hard to read. And uh, so this is uh, just the R source code. What, what uh, has been provided with the workshop are the, the R markdown files for each of the worksheet or demo files. Uh, but also a file with just the R code extracted, and that's what I'm using here. Uh, I'm going to jump into the middle of this. I'm on line uh, 228, so I've already sourced the, uh, the, the header stuff loading the various packages. Perry? The first part of the worksheet. Yep. Perry, it's Olivia speaking. Can, can you increase the, the font size, please? Yep. Larger would be uh, better. Thank and, uh, you. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Good. So, uh, so I've jumped down. The, the previous part of the worksheet uh, goes through uh, what was in the slides. Uh, what I'd like to do with uh, uh, just a, a short bit of time remaining is to look at the part where we can look at a nimble function uh, and just see a glimpse of our algorithm programming system. So I'm going to load the, the, the geese data. Uh, okay. And we have uh, some of the setup, uh, get the first uh, occurrence of each individual. Uh, let's see. So at the top is my source code. At the bottom is my R session. Uh, let's see if I look at the top of the data. There we are. Uh, I think it's coded so that um, there are three sites. So those must be uh, one, two, and three. Uh, and zero must be unobserved. Uh, but it's uh, not crucially important for uh, the software part. So here is the DHMM code as a nimble function. Um, 
And what we've done is simply copy this from the Nimble Ecology source code, just like you could do with an R function. If you see an R package and there's a function of interest that you might want to learn from or modify or extend yourself, you can just copy that source code. It's written in R and then you can modify it and run with it. You can do the same thing with this distribution. Okay, so let me point out, let me point out some highlights of a Nimble function. The first thing is that these are something you haven't seen before in traditional R programming. These are type declarations. And normally R is uh, completely dynamically typed. That means X could be a list in one moment and a matrix uh, a moment later if you reassign it. Uh, when we generate C++, uh, C++ is statically typed. So once something is say a matrix, it has to remain a matrix. And uh, so what we need your help to do to make it easy to generate C++ is to tell us X will be a one dimensional double precision. So basically numeric. So that says X will be a vector. The initial probabilities will be a vector. The uh, observation probability matrix will be two dimensional. So that's double two transition matrix, two dimensional. The length will be scalar. So that's double zero refers to a scalar. And for a scalar, we can provide a default value, but actually in the model code, you need to provide it anyway. And when you're providing a, a new distribution or density in Nimble, you have to provide this log argument, uh, true or false, which is familiar from distribution functions in R. And you don't have to provide that in the model code. It'll always be log equals true when it's used in the model, but you do need to write it that way. Now the rest of this looks and feels like R. There's a whole bunch of error trapping, okay? Uh, checking that the lengths of things match. If the check row sums flag is true, then we do some work here where we iterate through uh, the rows of each of the matrices and check within a numerical tolerance, an absolute value difference of uh, one in a million, uh, that the sums, that things sum to one and we uh, bail out with an error if that's not the case. And the actual interesting math of a hidden Markov model is uh, down here uh, where we say pi is the vector of probabilities of being in a particular state at a particular uh, uh, time in the sequential calculations. The log likelihood will accumulate as we iterate through the steps. Uh, the number of observation classes is from the uh, number of rows of the observation matrix. We'll iterate through time, and I won't go through the math of this uh, in full detail, but uh, it, uh, this follows hidden Markov model math where we'll um, say that the probability of the current observation comes from summing the probabilities of uh, the observation, each combination of the state uh, that the animal might have been in and the probability of the observation from that state. Uh, we'll add those up for a likelihood contribution, add that to the likelihood, and then update the states using the transition matrix and normalizing it. And then we'll return the log probability. Okay, so by just following some uh, limitations, just using uh, basically math and learning uh, how to access dimensions and uh, kick out error messages if we want, uh, we can write a new distribution and use it in a model uh, in a way that will be compiled. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go ahead and run that. Um, let's see, so I'm gonna uh, split my screen again, go back to my R session, uh, and I'm gonna highlight this and source it down to my R session. And then here's the marginalized model code that was in the slides. Oh, oh, no, excuse me, this is the goose example. So uh, then let's look at that for a moment. Uh, so uh, this was, I think, from class six. So uh, there's a set of transition probabilities that are movement probabilities from uh, site A, either staying at site A or going to site B or site C. And the rows of the transition matrix are uh, survival at that site times uh, transition to uh, that site or one of the other sites. And the last element is uh, mortality, so one minus survival. And then we see that motif for uh, the second row from site B and the third row from site C. And in the fourth row, we see that it, dead, dead geese stay dead. Uh, and then uh, observations are either undetected or 
correct, there isn't any misclassification of a bird uh, recorded in the wrong site. Here you can see that I have uh, used this trick of making a copy of Y that is constant Y that helps tell Nimble uh, uh, that the relationship declared here, declared here will never change because this value will never change. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's my data and my constants with that new const Y I added just the same way Y uh, is set to y plus one, the, the indexing shift uh, that's that's needed. Uh, we can oops, uh, go ahead and follow the initial values, the parameters uh, we want, the iterations. And now we'll just run it with nimble MCMC and we'll see that run. So uh, I think I will stop there while we just let this run. Uh, that, um, oh, well, the, the uh, okay, I will uh, do one other thing, which is to, to just point out the weighted version of this. So this is an example of what would we do if we wanted to take the existing hidden Markov model, marginal distribution, and add this multiplicity. So uh, here we've made a newly added uh, parameter that for multiplicity. Uh, it's going to be a scalar, so it's declared as double uh, zero dimensional for a scalar. Uh, we're just copying everything else. Uh, and then the only change that uh, we need to do is, um, uh, well, it's in here, uh, multiply, uh, every time we add a likelihood component, uh, uh, multiply by the, the multiplicity factor, the number of animals with that same likelihood. In fact, I suppose we could have done that at the very last step here where we uh, return uh, the answer, but it's just fine to do it in here. Uh, if you follow through the math, that'll be uh, equivalent. And so that, if we run that, that will run uh, quite a bit faster. And how then would that appear in model code? The version of the model code with uh, uh, that would then uh, provide, would use our new distribution in the model, and then would uh, provide as a parameter to it, the multiplicity. And that multiplicity would be Let's see, so, the, so then there's some working from the original data to determine the multiplicity um, value for each record, and then to collapse the data set to only include one uh, of each uh, unique capture history. Uh, and then uh, the multiplicity is provided in the constants to the model because that will never be uh, for this particular data set. Okay, so with that said, I think we're right on time and I will stop there. I will leave it to anyone interested to run through uh, the case with this um, multiplicity or weighted likelihood approach. And you should be able to see if you go all the way down and run here uh, with the system time wrapped around it, you should be able to see uh, if everything works as needed, it's, it's quite a bit faster. Uh, oh, okay, I keep having a final point to add. <laughs> When you provide a new distribution to Nimble, uh, in some cases you need to provide the R function using R's uh, breakdown of, uh, you know, when there's a distribution, there's a D and R, a P and a Q function. Uh, so the R function would be to randomly generate uh, outcomes from this distribution. Uh, if it is not ever necessary in an algorithm to call the R function, then Nimble should tell you it's just putting a placeholder there and won't, and it's fine. It's kind of a, a dummy, it won't actually do anything meaningful, but it's not necessary for you to code it. Uh, in this example, when you first run this, uh, you'll actually be told that you do need to provide that. I'd have to double check why that's the case. Maybe if there's an incomplete initial value or something else I'm confused about. But in any case, uh, Olivier has put together uh, a nice example of how you would uh, have a simulation function for a hidden Markov model. Uh, and then at that point, you can go ahead and try again to run uh, with this code that uses the weighted likelihood that has the random draws provided for it. Uh, um, and then that should run and, and you should be able to see that run quite a bit faster. Okay, so we've seen, we've seen our uh, custom likelihood 
uh, run successfully. And so I will stop there and uh, uh, see if there are questions or Olivier will, will uh, tell me what to do. So thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Perry. Okay, so before you all leave, the plan was to uh, give you maybe a few uh, final words before we close the, the workshop. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna share my screen and share with you a few uh, last words. Let me. Let me share my screen again. Yeah. Okay, so we'll wrap up the workshop with a few um, take home messages and recommendations for conducting your own analysis. There's been a, a few, uh, well, a few, some discussions on the, on the chat uh, in Slack. So uh, we encourage you to refer to, to them, to these discussions, and especially about how to, uh, um, report the results in the paper. That uh, that was a very interesting uh, discussion, and Chloe provided very nice, uh, very nice pieces of advice. Okay, so yeah, we hope uh, to have provided you with a useful overview of how to use a hidden Markov model to analyze capture recapture data, and we have only scratched the surface of uh, what you can do with these models. And for you to do, to go a bit further, we have assembled a searchable list of HMM analysis of capture recapture data so that you can get some inspiration from them. So it's, uh, let me uh, let me show you how it works. Yep, yep, that's my whole screen. Yeah, so it's a, it's a table basically with uh, authors, your titles, and then you have a, a keyword for the ecological question that is uh, tackled in the paper, and a keyword for the methods, uh, the method that is used in the paper. Like uh, um, maybe it's it's more of a paper about software or state uncertainty or memory. And those keywords refer to to the keywords we used in the uh, in the title for the lectures. Uh, usually, um, okay, it's not perfect, but uh, at least there are some uh, some. Uh, some papers you can uh, you can have a look to and uh, feel free to um, email us to uh, um, to to feed this list. Uh, we're happy to uh, to add uh, papers to that list. Okay, uh, let's go back to the. Uh -huh. Okay. Again, this list is not exhaustive huh? and uh, get in touch with us if you'd like to add a reference. Um, so before we, we all leave, we'd like to give you a few uh, pieces of advice. Huh? This is not uh, rocket science or like uh, uh, definitive answers or to your questions, but a few things based on our own experience uh, of Bayesian capture recapture analysis with uh, hidden Markov models. So, um, hang on. First things first, make sure you spend some time to make your ecological uh, question explicit, uh, obvious one. Huh? This step will help you uh, to stay on course and make the, the right uh, choices. For example, it's okay to use, uh, that's something we use, uh, we, we do all the time. It's okay to use a subset of your data to address different questions. Now, in terms of modeling, um, like we said uh, repetitively, uh, repetitively well, several times, don't jump onto your uh, on your keyboard right away to try and code your model. Spend some time spend some time thinking about your model with pen and paper. In particular, make sure you have the observations and the states of your uh, hidden Markov model of your of your model. Uh, then write down uh, the observation uh, matrix, and um, and you may act first as if you had no imperfect detection, like we did in the, the first lecture on HMM. Uh, this is really what you're after, the ecological process, survival, dispersal, recruitment, whatever. And then you may proceed with the observation matrix. Uh, that's one trick to do. First, you make your life easier by saying there is no issue with observation. So you focus on the ecological process. And then on top of that, you add the detection process, the observation process. Um, 
uh, when it comes to model fitting with nimble, start simple. Uh, consider, for example, all parameters constant and make sure uh, convergence, convergence is reached. And then add complexity, time effect, for example, or random effects or uncertainty in the assignment of states and so on. Okay. Um, when it comes again to model building, uh, you may consider simulating data uh, to better understand your model. We said that several times during the workshop. You will always learn something on your model by seeing it as an engine uh, to generate data instead of estimating uh, its parameters. The cool thing with Nimble uh, is that you can model the, you can use your model to simulate data. And there is a tutorial for that. Uh, if you click here, you will be taken to this tutorial. Okay. Another advice, uh, quite general in programming, is to not try to optimize your code uh, right away or to try to make it uh, elegant right away, to make it work first and then think of optimization. That's uh, this uh, this sentence by Donna Knuth, who was the creator of uh, tech and an author of uh, The Art of Computer Programming. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. So first make it work, then think of optimization. And there are more recommendations on the Bayesian analysis in this recent paper by uh, uh, by Gelman and by Andrew Gelman and colleagues called uh, Bayesian workflow. And there is a link to the paper. They offer uh, a workflow for Bayesian analysis in which they discuss uh, model building, model comparison, model checking, model validation, and uh, model understanding and troubleshooting for of uh, computational problems. So it's a very, very interesting paper. It's a very long paper, but it's kind of a, a small book, uh, uh, but uh, very worth reading. Okay, so I guess uh, till next time, uh, the Slack uh, space will remain uh, open for some time and we'll be happy to uh, answer the questions you might have related to the workshop uh, for, I don't know, for some time after, after the end of the workshop. Huh? We will update uh, the workshop uh, website in the coming weeks uh, with uh, correcting all the typos and uh, and uh, things we've seen during the, the lectures. And also uh, we will uh, put the video recordings uh, on the uh, on the website, available from the website. It's all, they, these are already available from YouTube, but uh, there will be a link on the website as well. Um, any feedback uh, you might have will be uh, appreciated. Um, there is this, uh, there is um, a feedback form. I sent you the link through the chat in Zoom and also uh, uh, in Slack, and I will send you an email just to uh, remind you to fill in the form. It, it would be very, very uh, uh, useful for us to improve the material for next time. And our plan, like we said uh, in the chat, is to gather all our exchanges, the questions and answered in a frequently asked questions section on the on the website. And last, uh, book is on its way, uh, hopefully, uh, based on the material we used for the workshop and more stuff. And um, also the book will be uh, about case studies, reproducing analysis from published paper, and hopefully more in uh, 2022. So stay tuned. Okay, I guess. That concludes uh, the workshop. Maybe Maud, Sarah, Perry, do you want to put your uh, video again, your camera on again, and so that we can say uh, bye. Okay, guys, thank you very much for attending the workshop. And uh, yeah, feel free to uh, continue asking questions and exchanging on the Slack. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. Bye. Thank you very much. And yeah, take care.